Yay! <laughs> oh. <laughs> we hope if I put the volume up, won't it? But those, those noises are great. Good morning! Good morning! Good morning! There goes the neighborhood! And there was much rejoicing. Didn't your meds kick in yet? We got David Lefter with us here. He's a Long Island arts guy. He's got his own radio show. I want you all to really enjoy a wonderful program done by a fine artist. A glorious thing of unparalleled beauty. Dave's gone by. Dave is one of my very favorite broadcasters, so keep on listening to Mr. Dave. Tropical hot dog night. You like two flamingos in a fruit fight. Every color of day. Whirling around at night. Well, there goes the neighborhood. Good morning and welcome everybody to the Dave's Gone By radio, audio, video program of the stream. Live with you here on this Saturday morning. June 23rd, 2018. Dave left. Let's see, February, March, April, May. No, I thought it was six months past my birthday, but it's only five months past my, my big birthday. Not that that matters about anything, but welcome to you. We have a fabulous show as we always do every Saturday from 9 until noon Mountain Time or thereabouts here in Greeley, Colorado from my gorgeous office. That's the one thing I wanted to do. I'll try this later. Is maybe. Because um, this is sort of looking up at me. I have, like, put it on the book. Put it on the Brian book. Brian Posen. You want to put it on yeah. the book? Yeah. Let, let me try this. Okay, um, you do your stuff. I don't know if I have a real... I'm in my office as an adjunct professor at the University of Northern Colorado. And I don't actually have any books in the office. All I have everywhere is potatoes. It's kind of funny. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's okay. But I do want to try. I want to see if it actually looks a little better, if the lighting is better, if I angle it. Um, well, you're on camera, babe. There you go. I'm going to put it under the ketchup book. Well, that, that might make a little bit of a diff. Here you go. I like that. Hmm. But I'm reading this book. This is the bookmark, the Marsha Harden book. Oh, uh, yeah, my wife is reading. Want to lift it up? She volunteered. No, lift up the. Oh, even further. Uh, I think that's going to be a little wobbly. Well, let's see. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, baby. Let's see. No. Yeah, this is. What do you think? What do you think, Con? Better or no, worse? No, I don't. Lift it up. Oh, I have to put that. Nah. Lift it up. Okay. Oh well. well. We'll do this. This is this works. Probably should have done this in R and D beforehand. I'm sorry for making you nauseous before your breakfast, but hey, that's my job as a broadcaster to make you all nauseous. That's my darling and adorable wife. Put lean it back. Yeah, like that. Look, that's even. See. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the thing. It's always you got that crooked you're, you're tilting ceiling. The, yeah, but you're yeah. also tilting the thing. There we go. That's a little better. Is that better? better? You... Well, let, let me know, folks. I mean, all the folks who are watching, Tony and Tom and Peggy and Art Paul. I welcome Art Paul uh, and all all these cool people who are checking out the Dave's Gone By program. Is it better? Yeah, better. it's got it's more level. It's more yeah. even. It's the only thing about this program that is level and rational. I've got, we've got so much to talk about even before we get to the aspects of the show, including our special Runza Cup. Runza! So, do you want to start with the Runza Cup? You this can. beautiful thing? You explain. Well, we were doing some shopping and stuff in Loveland, Colorado, here, and there's a fast foodish chain in Loveland that I've never heard of. I've been living in Colorado for nine years. I'm from New York. I know Burger King. I know McDonald's, Wendy's, Arby's, uh, Jack in the Box from back in the day. What are some of the White others? White Castle. White Castle. Uh, uh, Arthur Treacher's yeah, Fish Yeah, I and thought chips. the same thing. KFC. Yeah. Um, we know these places. Like Dairy right? Queen, those kind of places. And what's some of the places that are here? Hardee's. Good Times. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, Good Times are already over in the restaurant. Sonic. Sonic. Yeah. right. Well, there's a place that's called Runza. Runza. And they've got an outlet in the middle of Loveland, Colorado. And what do they do? They're essentially a fast food place. And they've got hamburgers, bacon burgers, cheeseburgers, really nice crinkly fries. But what they're known for is they mix in with their crinkly fries, if you ask for it, onion rings. And they do very nice onion rings. But their specialty, as it were, is the Runza sandwich, right? So it has a name we don't remember. Yeah. Want me to look it up? 
Oh, on your, on your, yeah, I'll do that. or on my phone. If you I'll want. do it. So here's the Runza thing. They take ground so beef. Another potato fell. I, I saw it. Yeah. They take ground beef and they put it in this sandwich of white white bread and they mix the beef with a lot of cabbage. So it's not quite a crowd burger, which we also have here in Colorado. It's more of a cabbagey slaw ish, but it's not really coleslaw. But it's pretty good. It's, if you think of a sloppy Joe, but without the tomato sauce, just spiced beef with a lot of cabbage in it, um, it's very tasty. It's not terribly expensive. You will, let's just say, you'll eat it, and an hour later you'll pay for it. And, and as all with all fast food, but the, the cool thing is, and this is completely unexpected. Here, honey. We go there for a beverage. What is it called? Is it a runza, runza witch? It's oh, it's called the runza, because it gives you the runza after you eat it. <laughs> no, actually, no, I didn't. <clears throat> I, I I will tell you flat out. I did not get diarrhea after eating that runza. Jeez. So that, that's there is no higher recommendation for a restaurant. <laughs> a new place, especially a fast food place. And I say, you know, I did not get diarrhea from eating there. So yay for Runza. But the most important thing that we did get is it's only a dollar <clears throat> to fill up your drink cup at one of those dispensary things with uh, soda. It's not a dispensary. What do they call it? Uh, it's a soda machine. Machine, yeah. yeah dispensary. You know, you press the button, you get Coke or Diet Mr. Pib. I want to see if so they have their sand, if they're a picture of their cup. But they've got... The runs a cup, and look what's on the end of it. Look at that. Look, look, potato. This is for you. They're talking about you. It is the crinkle, crinkle little potato cup. Because apparently they're really known for their fries, which are very, very good. I'm sorry, potato. I know. I, what? Oh no. What do they make there? I, I'm sorry. But look, you they, son they, of a bitch. They only okay. have the cup one way. They don't have it both ways. See? They all well because this may be a limited version. That might be yes. It doesn't say. It's beautiful, though, isn't yeah. it, folks? Anyway, speaking of beautiful... They don't have anything that shows a picture of the back of the cup. Hmm. I don't know what to... Maybe to, you're yeah. the only one... You're the yeah, only one that's why right. I, I liberated this. Most people throw these away. You might be the only one who got that. You should have asked for a second. Okay, well, we might go back in like a week or two. So if we're back in a clean one, yeah. Yeah. You could get an ice cream. Oh, the, that was cool. I, the, I felt bad. And milkshakes. I always feel bad about not getting ice cream for the obvious reason that I, I didn't get ice cream. But the day we were there, they were giving 50 cents off every dollar ice cream you bought to uh, Alzheimer's Research. But also, they're like a dollar and they have little milkshakes. You, yeah. love, you love milkshakes. I, like milk I, I like used to buy cream. a milkshake every morning when you did the show. Yeah, they didn't have um, squid flavor, no, which eight. I would have liked. Um, oh, th Cuttle then fish. here's the deal. We, boy, talk about good eating this week. So we. Went to this place, this Runza place. I had the, the weird Runza burger, which that was That was more later in the week. Yeah. Earlier in the week for... It was... Oh, it was your birthday. It was your, your birthday last Saturday. So I went with our friend... <clears throat> pardon me. Tony, female friend named Tony, to celebrate Joyce's birthday. And decided to do that at one of her favorite restaurants. And I, I, I like this restaurant, too. Called Biaggi's. Which is also, I think, also in Loveland. Yeah. And this is an Italian place... Now, what do you like there? What's the thing that you really enjoy? They have a, for me, they have a really delicious goat cheese, beet, and they used to have um, pistachio, but now walnut salad. Mm. And I, I can't have that much, like, super, super salt, but you can get it with, like, salad and pizza, half a pizza, salad and soup, salad and sandwich, and then you can refill the salad or the soup. It's great. It's, and the it's food is really delicious. good. delicious, and I yeah. love their bread with a little olive oil and Parmesan. Ugh. So it's called Biaggi's, yeah. and it's in Loveland. They also have a wider menu than that. She's yes, vegetarian. Yes. I'm not. I'll eat anything. I'll, I'll eat this carpet. It was not you know, tacked uh, no, down. It's kind of messy. Okay, well, I remember back in the days I used to uh, eat carpet. Uh, oh, ow, 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 ow. Anyway. <laughs> ah. So, I would lick it, lick it clean later. So, <laughs> they have Whatever. meat and fish and, and pasta dishes, especially. It's an Italian place. And I go for. Well, something that's on their, their regular menu, I think. It wasn't even No, it wasn't a special. special. It yeah. was like lobster pasta. Lobster pasta with black... Noodles. Pasta. Black yeah. pasta noodles. And this intrigues me, because I'm always going to try them. I'm, I'm uh, apart from the suicide no, and the fame part... I found it. I found you it. You found it, but, but instead, you know, apart from the suicide and, and um, 
fame? And fame and handsomeness part. I'm basically oh, you're Anthony Bourdain. You're handsome. Well, thank you. You're very yeah. handsome. Well, I'll try things. I want to try new yes. things when I go to restaurants. I'm sick of eating the same things in restaurants. I want like, oh, oh, that's really disgusting. Let me try that. So I'll, I'll get something new yeah. at a new place. So I'll eat, um, I look at this, a black pasta. Yeah. With, and I love lobster anyway. So lo they had me at lobster. Mm -hmm. And then they had me at this weird, colorful thing. Yeah, and I asked yeah. the waiter... Well, what is it? How do they? How is it black pasta? Did they get it from a bad neighborhood or something? Where, where does it come from? And he said that's that it is funny. made flavored and visualized, well, colored with cuttlefish ink. Well, if they had me at lobster, they had me twice at cuttlefish yeah. ink. I guess it's, we're not talking about like a place that's so fancy. It's or like fugu. A dish. It's not like, a, or it's not like yeah. a, it's not like a, a Japanese, you know, high end. It's not yeah. bonefish where they you'd think bonefish yeah. would do. I that. think bonefish isn't that expensive. Yeah. But suddenly we're in a regular Italian place. Oh yeah, this flavor with cuttlefish yeah. ink. They had me. I was there. I was like. Bring me this immediately. No, you were eating it when you found out it was cuttlefish. Oh, I was already yes. eating it. and I ate one, and then they're like, what is this flavored with? And we're like, a cuttlefish. Right, Joyce the vegetarian who doesn't eat meat or fish. She's actually allergic to fish. Yeah. So I'm already eating it. I say, you're having this. It's just yeah, a course. noodle, eat it. and there's mushrooms in it. You can have it. It's not, there's no, just stay away from the lobster part. You can eat it. And I say, well, well how is this uh, noodle flavored? I said, well, it was cuttlefish ink. What happens <laughs> if I had a cuttlefish allergy? It would be, yeah. It'd be, it'd horrific, be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have a cuttlefish allergy? I'm sure allergy? somebody must. Well, anyway, it was very cuddly. I loved it. It's delicious. I'll get it probably next time I go. I won't get it that many times because then I'll get tired of it. But, but oh, the cuttlefish noodles at Biagi's. Mm, thank you for having a birthday. Because uh, I'm going to try yeah, that. Yeah, because my birthday is just a vehicle for your enjoyment. Yes, pretty much. Yeah, but I think all, right. all of life is just a vehicle <laughs> for my enjoyment. Yes. Except this week, which you have to admit is a fucked up week. Mm, I know. I mean, despite the good food. Mm. And, you know, first of all, I woke up this, or it wasn't even this morning. I had it yesterday. My hips, for some reason, are, are killing me. Maybe I'm pregnant. Uh, that could be a thing. Because I I, I'm a low, load-bearing person. So I might be having... Maybe you're having a potato baby. Some, something ec ectopic or maybe, ectopic maybe with potatoes. Maybe you're having a potato, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of not moving the way I normally want to in a little bit of uh, discomfort. Yeah. So if, if any of you have Tylenol, the folks who are watching here, you can send it. Do you want it. some? Um, maybe, yeah, maybe when stuff's playing, I'll, okay. I'll pop one. Oh, it's not too bad, actually. Because <clears throat> I pooped. Oh, this no, morning. please, please. And I, feel, no, I feel better. When you have a bad back and, and or bad hips and you poop, you actually, it sort of, it, it eases things down here. There's less pressure. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's such, what, 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 whatever. If there's one whatever. thing I can do three hours a week or three and a half hours a week on a Saturday morning is tell the truth. And there's a truth in that. Uh, and I, I was kind of hoping that it would actually go away because that has happened. And once in a blue moon, I'll have an ache down there, and I will, and I'll be pretty much 100% better. But that didn't happen. God help us. So now you know. All the folks watching, Peggy and Art Ball and Pascal. Welcome, Pascal. If you have no idea what the hell I'm doing here, what I'm talking about, this is a real, actual Facebook slash radio program. I'm Dave Lefkowitz. That's my wife, Joyce. It's called Dave's Gone By. We have amazing folks um, or amazing stuff to do on the show. First of all, our guest is going to be a Tony-winning actor. Somebody who won. <laughs> My friend Lisa from the Riders Group writes, it's too much information for most people. I'm assuming she's talking about uh, the cuttlefish. But, and <laughs> she says, <laughs> but, she's, but I want to know. That's scary. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. <laughs> and she came to Miracle of Long John, so she knows. Yes, yeah, she you know, understands your, 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 your repertoire of humor, <laughs> your milieu. <laughs> So we're talking to, or Rabbi Saul Solomon will be talking to Tony winning actor. What did he win the Tony for? Ah, uh, well, that's the thing. Some people, you're in yeah. a musical, it's popular for a yeah. little bit. It, it, maybe it's a hit, it makes a little money, it mm -hmm. tours a bit. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you're in a, a show, you get an award. People forget the show the year after it plays. Yeah, yeah. As a, but sometimes, very rarely, you're in a show that is iconic. You're in a show that is, is he in just... Cats? Oh, God, no, it was not Hamilton? No, it was not in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Older, a bit older. Believe it or not, 22 years older, Whoa. by the way. 
He was in the original cast. Rent? Of Rent. Yeah, woo! Wilson Germain Heredia, or Heredia. 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 He was Angel, so he's kind of... I believe that's best. on hell. Uh, in the show, well, they called him Angel. Because uh, remember, he's an angelic sort of character. And I think the character dies. Uh, I hope I'm giving anything away in that. Uh, Christmas bells are ringing. Okay, but focus. He was in Rent, the original <laughs> Rent. Um, I think he even played Rent in London. He's in the Rent 365. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Which is the, kind of the ideal time to have him. Because remember, we had, yeah. well, not we, when we were watching the Tony Awards two Sundays ago, mm -hmm. or a Sunday ago, uh, what was one of the big moments for most people who weren't even into theater that much was when they got the Parkland student survivors out there. Uh, yeah. because they oh, had they sang a Rent thing. song. Yeah. They sang that song. Yes, Seasons of Love. yes. So it was, this, it was the one takeaway take moment besides Robert De Niro yeah. of... of here are these kids, they had this unbelievably unforgettable, horrible day, and now the Broadway League is giving them a night that they will remember in a different way, in a positive, beautiful, unforgettable, happy way. Mm -hmm. And they came out there and they sang Seasons of Love, and they had the girl out there, I, can, I don't know if she's ever going to make it to Broadway, but she did the high notes. Yeah, but every ah! week, you know, but they, that's what you got to do. <clears throat> I know, I know. That's what you do on a farm. <laughs> that's right, Potato. So... Uh, but, but it was a, a touching moment, right, for the park. And what did they sing? They sang Seasons of Love uh, from Rent. Well, among the people who were singing that song back in 1995, when it was mm. workshopping, and then at New York Theater Workshop, mm. and then in 1996, when the show moved to Broadway to the Nederlander Theater, was Wilson Germain Heredia. And what's kind of cool is he is not the first alumnus of Rent to be on this program. Can you guess? Here's a little trivia for you. Who else do we have a few years ago now? Harvey Firestein. No, he was, he was never in Rent. Uh, I'm not gonna pay last year's I Rent. Don't, I don't remember the people's names. Yo, know, can did you ever see Rent? No. Oh, uh, well, that, that makes it. Let's see. So, well, then I'll just give it away. I was too busy working to pay my own rent. <laughs> Good point. Fair I enough. can't see the theater. <clears throat> I have to work to pay my rent. I'm the proletariat. Well, she's been busy. She, she was in... A couple of other Broadway shows. She did a, a well-received off-Broadway show this past season. Daphne Rubin Vega. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Now I interviewed Edina Menzel, but not for this radio program. No, so not I'm, for I have a few different Rent connections. Yes, but you do. Here's the deal: we got another Rent person. We got a Rent tenant. That's what they shouldn't be called alumni. They should be called tenants of Rent. Yeah. Except they're not really tenants because they're squatters. Subleasers. Yeah. Sub we have a squatter on the show. Wilson Germain have an idea. Why do we have him on the program? Because he's going to be doing... Because he's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. Not, you're right. Because he's awesome. Yes. And also because he's doing a musical at the New York Musical Festival that's mm. going to be happening in July in Midtown uh, at the Acorn Theater. It's on uh, Theater Row on the west side. Uh, in the f Well, it's on West 42nd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. That gives you all What's the What's he doing there, though? He's playing a character named Poppy. As opposed oh, to Poppy. As opposed to Papa, which is what a potato. As is. somebody who grew up in a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood, you hear Poppy a lot. Well, he's of Dominican extraction. Yes, I Poppy. I Poppy, and, and it's all about actually Cuban kids. Or you actually hear I Mommy. Well, yeah. What is that? Well, like mommy. Or you see a cute girl walking down the street. Oh. I Mommy. I Mommy, yeah. Yeah. See, if I do it, it's racist. If, if you you can yeah. kind of get away with it. If I say anything like that, I papi. I, 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 I papi. Que pinga. No, the problem is for me now, because, well, not the problem, but words that Dominicans and Puerto Ricans use in Spanish are not words that people here use because mm. they're probably from Mexican origin or Mexican-American, so they're different, like el coche and carro. Right, yeah. When yeah. I say el coche, they, people here laugh and think it's baby carriage. Back in, oh. uh, when I say coche, that's what we used to say. Well, I learned coche in Yeah, but coche, yeah, but they say el carro. Uh, who says? The Dominicans? Out the here, they'll oh, here. say carro, okay. because yeah. if you say coche, they think you're looking mm, for yeah. your, yeah, your pram. pram. Yeah. yeah, cool. And, and Americans don't say pram. If no. you tell someone, oh, well, I need to buy a pram for... I'm a, yeah. So I, I'm excited to see what he's going to sing. Will he sing on the show? No, he's not going to sing on the, on the pram. Well, we'll probably play a song from Rent. Yeah. But he um, he's going to talk. He's going to talk to Rabbi Saul about, of course, being in Rent. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the whole thing, as you, I'm sure, remember... Yeah. 
at the just before the first preview of Rent Off Broadway, the guy who wrote it Died. dropped dead, yeah. and that just threw every. I mean, it, and it changed the whole nature of the show, and the show became a huge thing. And he'll talk about the play that he's in called, or the musical mm -hmm. that he's now in called Pedro Pan. It, it's not playing yet. It starts on July 10th wow. as part of the mu musical festival. But um, Pedro Pan, which is all about. Cuban immigrant kid. Whoa. So it's very relevant. De Cuba. Right now. Cuba. Mm -hmm. He also did La Caja Fall on Broadway. Wow. Opposite Harvey. I told he you. He was on I Broadway with you. Harvey. Right. Oh, Get God. Tom, tell it to. Uh, Get Tom, tell it to. Which yes. role did he play? Oh, he, he played... See, he does get a little typecast because he played Angel in Rent. Yeah. He was typecast as the very... Flittering a feminine oh, maid? gay maid, yeah, right mm. in Lacage. So that that's his other big um, Broadway role. He he was a replacement cast member for. Um, he's doing. He's been doing well. Yeah, he's doing great. Yeah. And he's got IMDb credits as well. Oh, and movies and stuff, yeah. or theater. I mean, um, uh, TV or, or movies. Both. Wow. I mean, yeah, I, I, he has, hasn't been on a series, but he's guest. Role yeah, in, in, in probably a Law and Order, I would assume. He's done a Law and Order. Yeah. Everybody but me has done a Law and Order. Yeah. Should have done a Law and Order at some point. But you do Greeley Crimes in all times. Very few people do that. I did a Law and Order. Really? No, you did, did not. Oh, yeah. I, I played a judge. I judged different ketchups. But, but what did that have to do with the murder mystery? There was murder? Oh, okay, I just... I don't even... Okay. So, we still haven't even talked about... These are all the good things that are happening. So, yeah. so we're telling you that Wilson Germain already is going to be on the program today. Rabbi Saul will be here. We'll have Grilly Crimes at All Times. We'll go inside Broadway for theater news. We'll have a Colorado Limerick of the Damned. We'll be talking about, very quickly, um, Avon. <clears throat> excuse me, Avon, Colorado. Avon? Every week we do Where a different that? place in Colorado. I'm not sure, but it's in Colorado somewhere. Wow. Yeah. Is, it like, uh, is that where Avon Cosmetics come from? Oh, I doubt it. I really doubt it. Because, you know, there was an Avon in England. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, but we'll have a, a limerick. And what else yeah. we have? We'll go back for more story time. Yes, we're finishing this book that never, the, Will Hans ever will ever get the cow? Ends. I hope Hans... Look how thin this book is. We've been doing it for four I, months I hope, now. I hope Hans <clears throat> gets the cow. I'll buy Hans a cow just to end the book. Yeah, right, you know? Yeah. And then there's also, if we have time... Well, maybe I'll have you thumb through. We'll do okay, give. Uh, a Dave's Big Dick Cherry. Here's Joyce. Here's what we do. The word is. My wife is, is going to thumb through. Hold on. Okay. She's going to thumb through the Webster's Dictionary. There's seventy-five thousand definitions in there, and she, her thumb is going to land at random. You want me to do it again? On a word. No, you, if you've got the I, word, I but do. wait to tell it. Uh, she's going to thumb. She did thumb through it. Picked a word at random, and then later in the show, I'm just going to talk about extemporaneously something about that word, something to do with my life. Some anecdote, something about that word. So it kind of puts me on the spot a little bit. But usually it's been kind of fun. And so, Joyce has already randomly, truly randomly, picked a word out of the dictionary. And that word is? Bluefish. No. It says a marine sport and food fish that is bluish above and silvery below. Bluefish. Blue above and silvery below. All right. Yikes. Couldn't have just done fish, huh? All right. And we were just talking about bonefish, the grill. Well, all right, we'll, we'll manage it. Bluefish. Blue, if you can remember that. Mm -hmm. Bluefish. Blue I would fish. write it. Want me to write it? Yeah, yeah, when we get a chance. I got okay. writing utensils. We'll, we'll do it. Bluefish. Oh, um, oh. What? My friend Lisa says, I liked your little high pitched voice, and I think you need a new alter ego named Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Timmy, go? I think it's like, Timmy, go. Do it. I'm, oh. I'm not sure what that means. And by the way, a, a farewell to our friend, since I'm talking about Lisa in our writer's group, to yeah. Gail. We're going to miss Gail. She's, um, she's tuned in a time or two. <laughs> Lovely lady. She's originally from Hawaii, and she's going back there with her cat. So hopefully she and her cat make the flight very safely. But she's, yeah. a, she's a great person if she happens to be listening. So farewell, yeah. Gail. And she gave us, she gave me nuts. Good. Which was very nice. She gave all of us nuts. Nice. Chocolate-covered Mauna Loa Hawaiian Those nuts. are the best. The macadamia nuts from oh. Hawaii are just like heaven. Yeah. Oh. I thought you didn't like macadamia nuts. I do. You never like macadamia I ate them when we were in uh, Italy. We had them with um, um, at the seashore at that town. You know what's really funny is... 
we sound so incredibly lucky and rich as we're doing this this the first 20 minutes of the show because I'm talking about eating pasta in this nice restaurant Going with cuddle ink yeah. and oh when we were in Italy and they said we're, we're lower middle class no, we're, we're living in Greeley shithole Colorado no we're actually different Peter Schneider who was a um, a sociologist and really kind of a, in many ways a Marxist I think he said that the artist because this kid was a playwright too like you Ooh, yeah, the actor yeah. Yeah. that artists and and academics are not, uh, we're like a, um, an intellectual class, so even though we have no money, we still have like lofty goals and dreams. <laughs> this is what artists tell themselves yes. when they, they look at their bank accounts yes. and they have bills to pay, and like, we have no money. It's okay, we're yes. a different class. Yes, Don't exactly. Matter. It's delusion. <laughs> Open it's up the, delusion. the Chef Boyardee, we're fine. Yes. It's good because we live on a different plane. We don't live on a different plane. Yes, and we, we will prove that this week oh. when we go to. Buy a couple of things at Target, and, and all right. Since we're feeling rich, we'll call it Target. Yeah. So we go to Target, and we park in their parking lot in like the early, late morning, early afternoon, yeah. a couple of days ago, and we're in Target and we're shopping for a water filter and, and you know other stuff and, and dishwashing liquid, and we're going around and in, literally within this building, which has. Doors up front, and you can see through the doors, but mm -hmm. when you're in the store, it's like a mall like anything else. You can't see yeah, no, anything. Yeah, no it's windows, all fluorescent yeah, lights. Yeah. But we sun, it gets darker. Yes. Lights flicker. Yes. And then we hear it's almost like... Golf balls from heaven. <laughs> yeah. Pounding. <laughs> yeah. You know. I'm not sure what that noise sounds like to you guys, but... Uh, pounding, pounding, horrible pounding. rain, we thought. Yes. And then we, we finish our shopping, we come, and, and literally we're getting our bags, our stuff together, and there's all these people lined up in the front of the store. Yeah. And there's in front just, of the window, the, the, yeah. the glass doors yes. and windows and stuff. And they're saying, oh, wow, it's all white on the ground. And that was the warning. Mm. That was the first thing that what had been a nice cloudy, 70-something mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. very late, the day before summer, mm -hmm. we had hail. <laughs> yeah. And we had hail that came down the size of, between golf balls and like quarters and yeah. about that size. And we literally, you know, and, and it's, still, it's still 70 degrees out. Yeah. And then we go into the parking lot and we're slipping yeah. Over hail Puddles balls, and hail balls everywhere. Hail balls, and we come to our beautiful, beloved eleven-year-old Subaru, yeah. and just it. And, and it's, we're hoping it isn't that bad because it's mm -hmm. all wet, mm -hmm. and we're thinking, oh, that's just rivulets no. of rain. On she the got hood. it. Yeah. No, no, we got so yeah. dinged and yeah. banged up. Yes. The hook of the car. The top of the car, which is fine, nobody notices that unless you're a basketball player. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're Manute Bowl or or that <laughs> Oh, I don't like the car top, yeah. Or that guy we saw on the tank yes, show yesterday yes. where you're eight. The foot eyebrow tall. guy, the eyebrow guy. Yeah. He was six ten. So yeah, he would notice the top of a car mm -hmm. if it was all dinged up. But everybody else all you're gonna notice is the that front hood. Amazingly enough we didn't have glass. Damage. No windshield damage. No windshield, which is weird. So you know what I say? I told the car she's going to go in for a makeover. Yeah. She's going to get a little cosmetic surgery. Because she's got stuff on the doors. She's got stuff on uh -huh. sort of the back yeah. part. Not that much on the back part, or no. just less noticeable, but the friggin' hood. Oh, yeah. my God. God took what the a, hit. What a mess. So, you know, calling insurance and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I will hold their feet to the fire, okay? So far, Geico has been fine. Um, I'm going to go to a place, an auto body place, where they have an adjuster there on Monday. Hopefully he'll hand me a check that is a reasonable vintage that will make me rich. Uh, and then we'll get the dents dinged out. Mm -hmm. Could have a rental car for two weeks. I mean, it's a big honking pain in the ass. But hopefully, mm -hmm. I don't know how these things work. I mean, it happens all the time mm -hmm. in places like Colorado and Kansas mm -hmm. and probably, I don't know, Idaho for the place that have tornadoes and hail yeah. and crazy ass weather, I guess people bring a car to the body mm -hmm. shop, they pay oom, oom, oom of money, mm -hmm. and the car comes out looking like, oh, yeah. nothing happened. Do you think that 
will happen? I think I think we need a new hood. I think that's oh, just yeah. quicker than banging out the stuff. And I think they can bang out the dents are little, and they can just yeah. bang them out. I don't, there's only one place that has maybe a, a little chip of paint yeah. damage. Everywhere else, I mean, is, I think yeah. that that's what it's like. That's what they do for a living, and they know best how to do it. I think we just have to make sure we get a good shop, and we, you know, we we get as much fixed as we can. Yeah. I just, you know, the, the funny part was just about three days, four days earlier than yeah. this, I had gone for a swim in our pool because, you know, we're rich people. We've got a pool in our community. Yeah. We've we got a complex pool, you know, where we, we got a complex pool, like a yeah. simple pool. A pool that gives me a complex. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was like, you know, it's a, it's a nice day, hot, but the sun was going down because it was like 730, one of the longest days of the year. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to go by myself. For a little swim. Yeah. And I just, I grabbed my stuff, and I went to the pool. I didn't even swim that much. I just hung and floated. Good. With, it was still light out. It was about, like, quarter to eight. Wow. Sun coming down, almost sun, not not even yet sunset at that point. And I'm looking at him, as soon as I get in the pool, a bunny oh, comes across the way. Oh, you love that bunny, yes. Because we can see. He lives know, there. That's lawn. his little hutch. Yeah. And he... Literally the whole time I'm in the pool, it was about a half hour or so, the bunny's there, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, Aww. he look at me, I look, he doesn't move, he's not really scared of me, but he also doesn't trust me, I do a little bit of swimming because I don't want to frighten him, but I, I paddle a little bit, yeah. and the whole time I'm just kind of hanging in this pool, floating, looking at gorgeous Colorado, looking at the nice houses around us, because we live in a very nice little complex, looking at the green grass, looking at this bunny, and thinking, life is good. You know? Life is nice. I don't have riches. I don't have the fame that I want. You know, I can think of all the bad things, but yeah. at this very moment, mm -hmm. I actually felt, and this is insane for a Jew, I actually felt a measure of happiness. Yeah, but you should still feel that way. I mean... I think it's like in Colorado, you know, you're gonna your car is eventually gonna get hail. It's part, it's being christened by Colorado, and yeah. you know. But it was just you know, that's mm. God coming back at me and going, "You happy? Okay." Yeah, I think pam, 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 it's pam, like pam. you said. That's all those million, hundreds of people did it. You know, it's just yeah. I mean, there were yeah. dozens and dozens of other cars in the parking lot who got hit. Obviously, just yeah. the same way we did. People have housing damage. I think the people have it worse are people who have pickup trucks if it hit the bed of the truck, like it dented all the bed of the truck. How do you, you think fix, that's worse? Yeah, how do you fix the truck bed? Like a hood's 300 bucks, right? Is it really? That's all? Uh, you can buy a used Subaru hood, like a Subaru hood plane, 300 Probably to paint it, spray it, oh. and everything, it'll cost way more. Because I looked up our car, and you can find it for like three, four hundred. Oh! But then they have to match the color. Yeah. They have to like fit and it. And labor. Yeah, labor's expensive. Yeah. But a truck bed, I don't know how you fix that. That would be the worst, I would oh, think. I, okay, it didn't even occur to me. Yeah, yeah, and if you had a broken windshield, you couldn't drive, so. Right, yeah, no, I can keep the car until they're ready to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. fix it up. And even then, they'll keep it in the shop for two weeks, I'm sure. Yeah. But it just, it, I just knew. And, and I even had, when I wrote and co-wrote, Shalom Dammit, and even with Rabbi Saul Solomon many years oh, ago yeah, for the yeah. rabbi, who, whom you will hear later, there was a line in the play about how Jews are afraid, um, I'm not mem remembering this completely, but something like Jews are afraid to be happy because the minute we feel happiness, <laughs> we feel God's going to take it away. So we're always unhappy and we figure, oh, if God sees we're miserable, he'll put the unhappiness on somebody else. And so I was like, I, I had that moment and I knew... I don't believe that. I think, I think it just happens. Well, yeah. It's like your mom, when she got the car, she got a dent. Our our admin, when she got the car, oh, yeah. you know, got in an accident. Like, stuff happens. Oh, of course stuff happens. You know, I don't think it's anything to do with any smiting. I think it's just like y things happen and you have to learn from them. Yeah, and I'm also, you I'm know? still waiting, though, for the next, the third shoe to drop. Because things tend to happen in threes, good what things and second? bad things. So we had, on the same damn day. The yeah. same day that our car got banged up by hail. Yeah. Uh, and um, I also, a place that I have been writing oh, for for yes. 15 years, uh, where I have a monthly column mm -hmm. of the nice woman who runs the place, the publisher, the, yeah, the yeah, editor, yeah. she said, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm sure she wasn't making any money doing it, too. Mm -hmm. That probably factored into it. Probably losing money yeah. for the past few years because who does a hard copy magazine in this day and age? And uh, yeah. decided, you know what? I'd rather, she's apparently well off, I'd rather help 
children in Haiti with medical needs. I'm like, okay, Good sure. You. sure. You've got a, a Jew in Colorado who has financial needs, but no, go help children in another country. Go mm. ahead. So, you know, it's not like I made a, a, any kind of any living writing for them. I've got a miss writing for um, the Long Island Pulse. I'll, I'll name it. Which is going under mm. at the end of August. But you're a beautiful writer. Oh, now thank you, you. Yeah. Now you teach. You're a teacher now, honey. Yeah, I be teach. I be teach in the fall. You do teach real good. I I I am English teacher. You are. As they do in, in all the movies we watch. You are a teacher. Me are teacher. Yeah. Yeah, me are teacher. Good good time. Good time, teacher. You smart man, teacher boy. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly we're racist again. How can, how can that go from b m messing up grammar to being like five dollar, five dollar sucky, sucky soldier boy? Oh, how, can, how can we get there? How do we go there? I don't Let's know. Let's do Greenlee Crimes in Old Times. Yes. I gotta go in less than an hour, David. So all right. So we'll leave. We we next week we'll talk about a, a game that we were playing. No, not that. Oh, kind let's of game. talk about it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. She loves this. Kitties. Huh? Explosive kids. Oh, I was going to talk about. We haven't even talked about Clue yet, so I, oh. I didn't even think of explosive. Oh. Let's wait. Let's hold okay. it for next week. And we haven't talked about the. Uh, I'd even like to get bananagrams too. I thought you were going to do bananagrams. So you could win bananagrams because you can spell oh, good. See, see, Joyce relentlessly beats me at Clue. No, no, tell them. I'm just, I'm just super, super competitive with oh. certain aspects of life, and that's one of them. You, you all, I'm sure you've all seen The Big Bang Theory. And the the sweet and very cute Bernadette, she's, she's got the high, cute voice. Yeah, but and yet, whenever she's in a contest, yeah, whenever or or she has to get somewhere or do something, she becomes a complete Jekyll and Hyde personality. Are you saying that's me? I would say that I wouldn't say you're on Bernadette's level, but there's something comes yeah, out of you yeah, when I'm you play a game. I'm competitive. Holy, when, whether you you're a bad winner and a, and bad a worse loser. loser. I know. I told you, in high school, I was second out of 450 or more for, for four eight years. straight semesters. I had only one semester where one of the girls tried to beat me, you know, because the, the woman who was first was German, and then the second, the third one was Gacher, which is German, and they always competed for Miss Gacher and all kind of stuff, Yeah. and then I was Austrian, so my mom's like, you need to do well. Oh, so she was pushing you. No, again. she I just, they, she well, no, no, she liked that I did well, and then... I was always second, and I didn't yeah. want—I didn't want anyone to—I didn't want to be first because it's a lot of pressure. Oh! But I, second was pretty good. I was salutatorian. Wow! Yeah. Salute. So yeah. you know, it's like I I'm fighting all. Hey, if I was you fight for, in college, for you four do? years, you're fighting to be number two. <laughs> As the emoji says, "We're number two. Uh -huh. We're number two. So makes you crazy. But when we play yeah, a game, I, I didn't know. realize this. Uh, and so I her, hate to lose. I hate to lose. It's like the cheapo gift for her birthday. I got us the game of Clue when we were at uh, the Barnes mm -hmm. and Noble in Loveland. And so we'll, we haven't played. Oh, we, we did open it. Did we open our our because we, we bought it from the library? We did. you signed it, but then we don't. We didn't play ours yet. So we we'll did, play our yeah, game. We did the kitties okay. one, but we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, there, there's another game called. We'll talk about exploding kitties next time, but. Um, but boy, oh boy, that, that unlocked a side of you that I don't... I'm very competitive. Yeah. You, how did you not know that? No, I know, but you're usually submissive-ish to me. I'm super, super competitive. Like, I'm, I'm very competitive. I'm, yeah. Usually with myself. It's like, yeah. you know, if, if something isn't going to happen and I want it to happen, I work well, hard. But luckily for her, mm -hmm. and I think we've played about 11 games of Clue, she's won nine of them. <sighs> Just because I have better deductive reasoning. Yeah, that, yeah, you know, that's why. That's you also want exploding kitties a time or two. You're a better speller, so if we did the the bananagrams, you'd win because you can spell. Well, no, but yeah, but I wouldn't allow you to put down a word that was misspelled anyway, so you could still win, you know? Plus, as we learned from when we played Scrabble with uh, friends and... and Rossick and Philippe. Philippe yeah. is de uh, deceased. Oh, wow. So see all that good Scrabble didn't do him a damn good because he, he won the game. Sick, he I mean, that that killed me. I've mentioned this on the show before. Well, last time I played Scrabble, it was with a bunch of friends who were not even from America. Though English was not their first language. First language was like French or something like that. French. They learned English till they came here. No, no, in they learned English in France. In, they learned English in France and they beat me in Scrabble. Because they know the roots of words. I know, but good lord, it was humiliating. Not that I'm not a little bit competitive myself. So, but the one thing about Scrabble is if you get a real, one of these Oxford 8,000 page dictionaries, if you put two letters together, it's probably a word somewhere. You just don't know it. You know, you say, oh, I've got Z-Q-X-I. 
Oh, that's a word. Zikwix. Yeah, and like, what the fuck? Yeah, but they know they this. They know it because they're smart. They open the dictionary and say, oh, yeah, Zikwix. It's a, a compound that's made with the banana oil and cuttlefish ink. It's, oh, sure, the yeah, Zikwix. Oh, lovely, 60 points. So I haven't played Scrabble or Bananagrams with the wife yet, but we, we're getting there, and at least I'll have a better shot than when we play Clue or Exploding Kittens, or when we role-play sexually. So, anyway... What? It's a Dave's Gone By radio program of the stream here, live on this Saturday, June 23rd, 2018. I'm Dave Lefkowitz, as I've said, that's my wife Joyce. We've got Wilson Germain, Aredia coming, Rabbi Sal, a limerick, story time, Dave's Big Dictionary about bluefish, a Saturday segue of songs in the news, going inside Broadway, and... Our weekly look at Greeley crimes and old times. <music> Greeley crimes and old times it is, and this is based on two stories in our local paper of news, the Greeley Tribune. And every week what they do is they publish... Two different columns. One I column. I'm going to cheat. What was that? I'm cheating. Oh, Joyce is cheating. How are you cheating? You just say the thing and I'll tell you where it's from. Uh, Lisa said something nice about the critiques I give in our writers group. And I see that uh, somebody else made a comment too. I think it might have been Art Paul, but What'd I can't she say? get to it. Just that I, I do some good cr critiques in the writers group, which is, you know, because I've been a critic for 30 years. So I'm incredibly judgmental and try not to be an asshole about it, which is the same thing my whole life. Very good. Yeah. So, here's the deal. Greeley Crimes in Old Times. One column has to do with phone calls that come into the Greeley and Weld County Police Departments from people who are saying, help, help, we need police presence, we need a, a police car or a supervisor or something, because this is going on. And it turns out most of these things are not particularly urgent. So, they're kind of fun, they're kind of goofy. And then there's Greeley 100 years ago, and this is where a guy, Mike Peters, who's actually been on this program, he'll go through the newspaper from 1918 and he'll look for the weirdest, funniest, most nostalgic pieces that were published in the Greeley Tribune Republican, it was called back then, the Greeley newspaper back then, and share them in a column. And so, are you ready for yes. Greeley Crimes and all times, my dear? I'm born ready. She's born ready. Ladies and gentlemen, a woman called police. Now, I don't have my phone, so I'm going to, this is going to be the ring, call. Ring, ring. Oh, there you go. We've also got the Uga horn. No, 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 no. That's too scary. Okay. A woman called police <laughs> because she suspected her husband yeah. was, you want me to take a crack at this? Um, feeding squirrels. No. Practicing witchcraft. <laughs> Wouldn't he be a warlock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A witch is a girl. It'd be warlock craft. Warlockery. Warlock How, why did she expect uh, uh, that? Why did she expect that? Uh, it doesn't say any more than that. Mm. You do that voodoo that you do so well. But, uh, yeah, th these are the kinds of calls that our police mm -hmm. department gets several times a day. For example, police were called... To 60th Avenue. Wow. Because the caller, who insisted she was not crazy... Yeah, I'm not crazy. <laughs> yeah. Said her neighbor tried to run her over with her wheelchair. What? I... Uh, Oh, my God. Come yep. on now, ladies. <laughs> I mean, ladies. those things can go pretty fast. <coughs> yeah. Really, ladies? <laughs> our neighbor tried to run her over with her wheelchair. Oh, God. What is it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Where did that go? Roll your neighbor know. down with... I don't think that's happening. I mean, uh, with a rascal, I can understand. It's that. good that she disclaimed and said, I am not crazy. And she, <laughs> that's yeah. good. That's the first, you know... Oh, man. First step, first step. Oh, Behold. Yeah. Now, you know, this was really cool like two weeks ago. An undocumented a uh, immigrant, I think it yeah. was, crawled up the side of a building 
to save a kid mm -hmm. who was dangling mm -hmm. from the thing. He, he was crawling up like the balconies or the there weren't any fire escapes. And he was immediately deported. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, God. You know, all, Donald Trump go, does a big event with all these people who had kids killed by illegal aliens. Funny that he doesn't do a similar event yeah, with see, yeah. people who've been saved and helped and fed and washed and nursed and oh, by, God. by illegal. But but this guy. I could be wrong about yeah. this, but he saw this child dangling from the side of a building. Mm -hmm. He crawls up the building like uh, a human fly and rescues like a kid. The, it's the most fantastic wait, thing. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Mosquito. I think your human fly is open. <laughs> so here's the deal. 100 years ago, Jack Williams, nationally known as the human fly, performed in Greeley last night by Whoa. climbing to the top of the new courthouse. Whoa. Whoa! You know, back then the courthouse was basically the size of his desk, though. Wow. Yeah. Um, his performance was disappointing, though. Oh, did he fall <laughs> or something? <laughs> right. No, he used a rope to pull him over the top of the building. What do they expect? Uh, yeah, yeah. He says, don't complain, though, because half the money collected from the large crowd went to the Boy Scouts. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not going to have a harness. You're not going to have... I think the Boy Scouts can pull their own rope. <laughs> well, no, they get a Scoutmaster. <laughs> I mean, they juggle that Scoutmaster around when he starts pulling 10-year-old uh, boys' ropes. Oh, if you know what I'm saying. And I think you do. Um, this one's about Weld County Clerk J.E. Snook. <laughs> Snooky? Yeah, right, yeah. Wow. He sent a letter to the editor. He or she, actually. Well, no, back then. Snook? J.E. Snook sent a letter to the editor complaining. <laughs> uh, you know, the more things change, the more about things remain the same. He was complaining about concerts having the Star Spangled Banner at the end of the shows. Why? Why? Because people were leaving early, and Ford automobiles make so much noise, no one can hear or sing the Star Spangled Banner. So he strongly recommended that the banner be played at the beginning mm, of the concert. That's not bad. Weirdly enough, he also asked everybody to take a knee during the song. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know. God help Seriously. us. But can you imagine they were arguing about uh, the way people were behaving during the singing yeah. of the national anthem 100 years ago? Nothing changes. changes. Yeah. Give us a good one from 8th and 8th. Oh, I, I don't think I have an 8th and 8th alert. What? I do have a response to 52nd Avenue by police for yeah. a report of a dog that caught a gopher. What? So what are you supposed to do? I don't know what they're supposed to do with a dog that can't... Do you, do you punish the dog? Maybe they do arrested you, the dog. The gopher? Yeah, I don't know. No no mention of whether they got Captain Stubing, Stubing too. I, yeah, I hope joke. not. I yeah. hope not. Or Isaac. But are there gophers here? As a, or are those prairie dogs also? I think it's prairie dogs. Yeah. Well, Maybe they meant a golfer. Oh, that could yes, be it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, county dispatchers received a call from a girl. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to give you something to put down because these are recording. Uh, I wish they were soft surface. Oh, I'll, just, I'll hold it here. Don't worry. I yeah, got it. Maybe on there. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Well, county dispatchers received a call from a girl in the Evans area yeah. who said she and her 16 year old sister had a serious emergency. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Their emergency was, mm -hmm. anything. they were bored. Wow, that is an emergency. It's, yeah, if you're that bored, um, I would send fire department, police. I, I, if you send the firemen, I won't be bored. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Everyone loves a first responder. You know, at the Sterling Theater in downtown Greeley this week, Ooh. they will have six vaudeville acts. Now, you know I love this because as a theater person, as a, a comedy person, 100 years ago, the Sterling Theater vaudeville acts, right? Including a miniature comedy, <laughs> eccentric dancers. <laughs> now, what are great names for a comedy troupe? You've got... The like Groundlings. Laurel and Hardy, Yuck Yuck, Ha Ha Funny. Right. Upright Citizens Brigade, yeah, these kind of memorable funny, Monty funny. Python's Flying Circus. Yeah. Back then, I swear to God, they had the comedy character delineators. What? 
Oh, wow. That's the name of their trip, the comedy character. That sounds character hilarious. That, that sounds oh, hilarious. Oh, boy. <laughs> and they, they, how long did they spend throwing out names? They delineated a lot of comedy there in that time. If I tell you. Also, dancing acrobats, skating contortionists. God almighty. <laughs> David, that sounds like my subway commute, right? Oh, God, the skating contortionists mm. and one other good act. Who? No, no, it just says that they probably a secret? were trying to find one last minute. Because, you know, do you really want to go up against the comedy character delineators? Or the skating contortionists. Those are... <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> and, uh, and if there's an accident, what? Uh, <laughs> what do they land on? What do they land on? <laughs> and, like, if, you know, there's a horrible pileup of skating contortionists, and then the, the doctors have to decide. So, are you, which are you supposed to be in this position, <laughs> or is that broken and hanging there intentionally or unintentionally? <laughs> does it normally look like that? Oh God! They should say, does it normally bend that way? <laughs> Oh. And by the way, admission for this was ten cents for children, twenty cents for grown-ups. Worth every penny. Oh, I, I would think I would go through that twice. Well, <sighs> those delineators are like you know, they're the Justin Bieber of the time. Oh man! Oh, let's see, let's see what else we got here. We got we have more. We have a street carnival in oh, Longmont, oh, Colorado. Oh, no, that's not a cat dog. They make that noise at the street carnival. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They've announced plans. Yeah, that's the delineators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they're going to perform in Greeley. Oh, wow. Exciting? Nice. However, Greeley officials said, and they did this in quotes, mm -hmm. never again. Why? Would they allow such a carnival in the city? <laughs> Apparently, six million peanuts were shelled. So, you know, never again. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, I, whatever. Whoa. No dancing, no carnivals. No delineators. Yeah. Maybe those acrobats were naughty. Police responded to 37th Avenue <laughs> for a report of children playing with a disconnected cell phone. And? I will repeat this. Yeah, Ooh. With a disconnected cell phone. Apparently they still sort of work-ish for emergency things. So the kids called 911. Oh, they didn't know. Yes, yeah. it still does work, yeah. To order Pizza Hut. <laughs> God bless them. True story. God bless them. They want some pizza. Maybe yeah. they send those kids to those girls who are bored and eating. They wouldn't be bored. Yeah, they wouldn't be bored at all. Uh, and then oh, they man. hung up. And then they called 911 back saying that they wanted pizza poop. <laughs> Was it you? It could have been me. And then they said they went poopy. <laughs> and these were 16-year-olds. So no, 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 they were, they were uh, graduates of our illustrious uni. <laughs> they went pizza poop. Pizza poop. Uh. Mm. So, yes. These are, in case you just tuned in and you don't know what we're doing, this is really crimes and old times. These are phone calls that come into police department here mm. uh, from, from people for various reasons. And also, stuff that was in the newspaper 100 years ago. For example, um, oh, I'm, my pages are out of order. Mm. How dare I? Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. Potato is very interesting in this. The Heinz Pickle Company has planted 1,000 acres of pickle crops. In Weld and Logan counties. Now the pickles will be packed, sorry, at the Heinz plant in La Salle. Wow. Do you know Heinz used to be here? I could have worked at Heinz. They didn't make ketchup, just pickles. You don't like pickles. Uh, you like ketchup. Actually, they wanted to plant squash, but harvesting them is too cucumbersome. <laughs> love that joke. Just love that. Pickle Rick! Okay, here we go. Let's see, what else we have to do the time of all time? Police responded to the to Fourth Street, excuse me. Oh, we're getting close. For a report of an intoxicated man yeah. who said that he needed help because he kept falling into a ditch. <laughs> it's like he kept, if he can call the police, how come he can't get out of the ditch? ditch. And, and, you know, it's like, is the ditch following him around? Maybe. I mean, you fall in once, you don't see it. Okay, you come out, and you walk away from the ditch. 
Maybe he wanted pizza poopies. Oh, I, that could be I'm it. The same. Yeah. Police also responded to 37th Avenue Tom, tell it to. for a report of two people leaning against a car making odd noises. Oh, <laughs> we know what that is. Possibly fornicating. Uh, you know, if people are leaning against the car making odd noises, fornicating is actually the nicest thing they could be doing, yes. so leave them alone. But maybe you can't do that in public. Well, you shouldn't, yeah. Maybe those near the children were getting the pizza poopies. <laughs> God. Well, if one person was turned the other way, then, oh, don't even, mm -hmm. don't even. Okay, so let's, I know this is really crimes at all times, but yeah. one thing that we do every week on, on this segment, as we move away a little bit from Greeley, Colorado, for a couple, one or two stories, further into the mm. universe, other places in America, other countries, mm -hmm. and we, we go elsewhere. So let's go elsewhere, first of all, to Laguna Beach, Florida. This is a report, though, in the New York Post. The bitter divorce battle... The bitter battle. Bitter battle. Between billionaire Bond King. They, they wrote oh, this intentionally. Billionaire Bond King. The bitter battle between billionaire Bond King Bill Gross. Oh, God. And his ex wife is beginning to stink. Uh -uh. Like vomit. Oh, David. Flatulent. David. And dead fish. What? The California money man lost his beloved $36 million, 14,000 square foot. Laguna Beach home okay. to his ex-wife uh, in, in the, the breakup. Okay. Uh, so he used foul-smelling sprays to leave the place a stinking mess, and he placed dead fish in the air vents. Mm. So said his disgusted ex-wife in court papers last week. Mrs. Gross, his family <laughs> named funny, Gross, yeah, yeah it's who, appropriate. She won a temporary restraining order against Bill last week. Has evidence of his foul play. Empty spray bottles in the trash cans, court papers led, and actually took pictures, mm. including included in the court filing are photographs showing the alleged spray bottles barf, fart prank, <laughs> and badass. Oh, God. Photos also show that Bill severed the cord to a treadmill and scratched the faces off an art installation of cats. <laughs> sick. Oh, the Bill's filthy having, rich. Yeah, yeah, divorce is bad. Divorce is bad, man. But, but wealth is worse on some level. Yeah. Well, can you imagine having an art installation of cat faces, and he just you know he just scratches the faces off all the cats. Mm. Um, but I want to get some of those sprays, man. You could look them up. What is it called? Poop spray. What is called uh, barf? Okay, barf spray. Yeah. It's like a little baby bottle. It's like the size of when you get the eye drops that you put in your... That's your small? Yeah, that's small. Fart prank. Oh, that, okay, bar, I mean, barf. Barf. Spray. Barf diet. Oh, barf well. emoji. Is it barf emoji? That's cool. Barf prank spray. Yeah, there it is, yeah. That's on Amazon here, I'll show you. Yeah, we'll, we'll hold it up to the... Uh, the screen oh so you guys God. can look at it. That doesn't look like they a bottle. They have Paco Rabanne. I don't know if that's like... Well, that probably smells like barf. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah. That's kind of... Yeah, that sort of looks like it. Hold on. Let me hold it up to the, the folks. Barf. <laughs> so, if you, if you want your house to smell like vomit... You can get it as soon as June... It's in stock. It's in stock. We can get it. Look, look, look. There it is. What it's, was the other one? Barf and poopy pants? One is called fart prank. Let me look up it's that. It's really hard to see. I'm sorry, folks. I'll get a but, better one. Yeah. What's the one? Fart prank? Well, Joyce is looking for fart prank, <laughs> the uh, the spray, which which actually smells better than I do at the moment. Fart uh, spray? Yeah. Fart, extra uh, strong? Oh, oh, they have the extra strong. Yeah, That's good. Fart blaster? It has, and it's lower sodium. Just so you know. Wait, uh, no, no, this is not the right. Oh, not the right. Fart gun. Well, Joyce is looking. Not a fart gun. There's a fart gun. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. Oh, that I God, want. David. Oh, let me this see. one is called Stinky Ass. Stinky Ass. That might have been one of the things that he... Yeah. There it is. Stinky Ass Spray. You can, oh, you can actually see it. Look at that. It's darker. What's the look, other? Look at the poop image and the fumes coming off it. Let me find the other one. What was it called? Poop smell? Uh, there was Barf. Fart Prank. Oh, people... Oh, look what they bought. What did they buy? What you see? So if you bought, bought Fart look at Prank, this. you might enjoy... There's also things sticking out the toilet. Look at this. What? Oh, no. Is there a f 
Oh, that's genius. Oh, I hope that is a gag, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is, and this is something I want for my next birthday. Really? Because I, I bought fake poop before. Mm. I've had fake poop, but it doesn't look as realistic as this. This is fake doo doo <laughs> that you can actually leave on the rim of someone's toilet. To and they bought that together. Well, they bought that together. Oh. Oh, this, this makes me so oh happy. By the way, what also makes me happy is to remind you that this is the Day of Gone By radio program of the stream. We are here every Saturday from 11 to 2 oh Eastern my God. Time. Right Li here on there's Facebook. There's a thing called Liquid Ass. Oh, that might have been it. Liquid Ass. Uh, and by the way, our Liquid Ass is exactly 10 o'clock Mountain Time, <laughs> noon Eastern. Oh, yeah. Can't work up a fart. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that does show very well. There you go. These are all available on Amazon, by the way. Thank you, dear. Thank What's you for... the fish one here? That's oh, just uh, fish? Oh, well, no, that one he did with actual oh my dead God. fish. Well, do you remember that we had a friend of ours, a guy named Jeff, who was having a fight with his landlord, yes. hating his landlord, and finally got out of his apartment, was able to leave. So what he did was he bought about five pounds of, I, I think they were uncooked, what is Raw it made shrimp. out of? Yeah, yeah. Hobo well, farts that have been compressed and liquefied by an evil person. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, so he bought these five pounds of raw shrimp from the supermarket, <laughs> and he left them in like the, the ducts and under the ceiling tiles and sort of stuffed a few under the carpets and by the, uh, the radiators and the ducts so that anybody, they would literally have to fumigate the place. It was the middle of the summer, too. So he left in like July and August, took all his stuff out, didn't leave anything visual where they could dock him, uh, what do you call it, the, the initial deposit, but he left all the shrimp surreptitiously lying around this apartment. And, and it's like, okay, thank you, landlord, I'm gone. Somebody uh, said they want to go for puke. Will it make the person puke? Probably, if you, you yeah. do enough of it. I imagine it would. It says, is this a good way to prank someone? Throw up is my goal. <laughs> That'd be my goal. That'd be my goal. And they said yes if the person has a, a gag reflex when they smell feces. I've gotten bad with that. Yeah. That was the other thing that happened this yes. week. Yeah. Let, you know, let me break in from, from Gridley Crabs at all times. It was actually a good week. I went for a swim. We had a nice meal. I went to the dentist. Yeah. And and uh, for the this is probably the, for the fifth time or sixth time in a row. No cavities. They complimented me for once because usually they're like, you've got to brush better and brush more often. And are you flossing? Are you using the electric thing? And I'm like, yeah, I brush every night, but I'm not twice a day. And this time they were like, good job. They still, they still worked on my mouth for a half hour yeah. and, and gave me you know, some agony. Didn't they give you some lady parts? L lady, I beg your pardon? Lady parts? No, they didn't no, give okay. me any la lady parts. when they're, they're, But... I was so happy, and they worked over my mouth, and they said, oh, we can tell you've been using uh, the electric toothbrush, or as I like to call it, the wiggly brush, which amused them no end, yes, and now they're going to use it themselves. Name. So I was so, you know, I, 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 nothing better than coming out of the dentist with no cavities, no problems. And so they're like, oh, uh, you still have a couple of your wisdom teeth. I'm like, yeah, expecting the invariable, well, you know, it's, pull they're, they're swollen, they're bad, they're coming. They're like, oh, no, if they don't give you any trouble, leave them alone. I'm like, yeah. So, happy, 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 and then the car. So that's, you know, that's the way the week has been going. Wow. Anyway, well, so let's get back to Greeley Crimes and Old Times, because we have a few more minutes for that. Um, this comes from the editorial book. Yeah, the editorial page. Seven-year-old Edgar... Ran into his Ooh. house to tell his mom that the boy next door was getting a licking uh -oh. because he was caught smoking. Yeah. The mother said, you don't smoke, do you? Oh, no. Replied Edgar, nah, I ain't smoked for more than two years. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. Whatever. That joke was brought to you by, the Al by Altria and the American Lung Association. Woohoo. <laughs> Nicorette gum. All that humor from a hundred years ago. That is, that's actually a pretty cute joke, come yeah, to think of it. That is funny. Police responded um, to 7th Street, almost uh, there. Uh, uh, oh, toward the nexus, yeah. For a report oh, no. of a neighbor who saw a man's genitals oh, well, oh, come on. as he urinated in the alley. <laughs> <laughs> 
I would just be curious. Isn't that public lewd, uh, lewdness? Yeah, but the thing is, a guy goes to pee. First thing, he's going to whip it out. It's going to be sort of, he'll turn, be turned away, right? Depends. And it takes a guy 30 seconds to pee at most. I don't most. know. Maybe the person looked really well. The guy must have a big ding-dong. <laughs> I'm serious, because if I go pee, if I'm, not that I do this you're in public. You're also more, you're more shy. I'm shy, or I'll be close to the yeah. thing if I want to. And, you know, I'm Jewish. You know, I take my dick out. You, know, you need a satellite thing with a special telescope you're to beautiful. see it. Don't, don't, ow. Ooh. But I'm saying, this guy, for, for someone to notice, not just like a guy standing they, there no, peeing. No, I think they just wanted to get him in trouble. Yeah, not just the stream, but, oh, I saw his, his No, I think they wanted thing. to get him in trouble. That's I it. guess. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway... Uh, what else? What else? Police in Loveland are upset um, tell it to. with the town council. Why? Because they raised the night marshal's salary from $80 a month to $90 nice, a month. Good. A month yeah, you. good, good. But when the day marshal... more applied, than I make. <laughs> you know, it's, more, it's actually sometimes more than I fucking mm. make. Anyway, mm. but when the day marshal applied for a similar raise, they denied it. Mm. So now the day marshal quit and they're, the town is without a day marshal. So mm, that's they should true. pay the night marshal more. Nobody wants to work at night. That's the point. I know. Uh, uh, but I don't know, back then, it was 80 or $90 a month a decent I don't know. salary? Well, they could see the delineators or wherever they were. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, all oh, those comedy If they threw in the tickets to that, they'd keep <laughs> their job. They'd be like, oh, I want to stay. Oh, man. Hey, let's go, before I forget. Okay. Let's go to our other Elsewhere Dateline. Oh. And by the way, welcome to Nancy. Nancy. Nancy, you got up late. Well, you missed the whole first oh hour. Oh, my goodness, Nancy. So we'll redo it for you. So we yes. were talking about, um, let's see. What were we talking about? Barfing and pooping sprays. Delineators. The, the comedy character deline delineators. Uh, I had cuttlefish ink in my pasta. Wow. What else did we do? Talking a little bit about playing games and yeah. Joyce being a bad winner and loser. Yes. That'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Good that's ketchup. what you missed. Mm. So here we go. Dateline, and we've been here. Um, tell it we have gone to and stayed at a bed and breakfast, because rich people that we are, in Hartsdale, New York. Yes. Remember? It was nice. We it was stayed beautiful. In house. Yeah. Yeah. Dateline, Hartsdale, New York. Captain Lawrence Brewing Company mm -hmm. has teamed up with Carvel to create a beer based on... I know we need some kind of noise for this one. Yeah. Carvel, and this is absolutely true. This brewing company in New York is doing a limited edition craft beer called Fudgy the Beer, based on Carvel's magnificent Fudgy the Whale cake. This is, this is real. They did it wow. as a tie-in for Father's Day. It's a mm -hmm. stout. That, and this is a quote that includes Carvel signature crunchies and fudge in the mash, and Carvel fudge in the I'm tank. Open the door. I'm hot. Are you hot? Oh yeah, it's kind of warming here. They're, they're putting Carvel fudge in the tank. And let me tell you something, hon. Last time, last time I left fudge in the tank. Oh, it, oh I, I blew the joke. Hold on. Last time I left fudge in the tank, I had to call a plumber. <laughs> yeah, that's comedy right there. Oh. <sighs> Cooler, huh? Now, this was intended to make a float, like a stout float for Father's Day. Oh, yeah. Apparently, you said that it was something ridiculous. Like, for a six pack, $18, it was $18. Yeah. $18 for a six pack. Must be good. So, $4 for like a little uh, fudgy yeah. the whale beer. I'm saying, can Cookie O Puss Shanty be far behind? <laughs> Remember? I and know, did you remember that Cookie was supposed to be from outer space? Yeah. I thought there was a different character that was from outer space. No, but I guess Cookie, Cookie Puss, Puss was from outer space. An alien. Yes. An illegal image. Can you imagine migrant Cookie Pusses in a, in a camp? Deported. Kept deported, in cages. Deported. Yeah. Mm. After, I'm just happy Tom Carvel is not alive to see it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. that would have killed him. Yeah. You know why his coffin's unpleasant? Why? Less air! <laughs> All right, we're doing yeah. We're doing really crimes in old times here on Games Gone By. I can't even... How do you do his voice? Mm -mm. It's, it's a, a mix of Tom Waits and throat cancer. Oh, uh, what Nancy wrote. Oh, hello, Nancy. It's practically working for free. Oh, 90 bucks a month. Well, not 100 years ago, not really, but it's still... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you. Let me tell you, I made less than 90 bucks 
a month writing for this magazine that just closed. So there you go. But it was just one column. I know, I'm bitching. What can I tell you? And I'm, I look pretty bitching in this shirt, don't I? So let's see. Um, police responded to First Avenue. We're gonna walk down to First Avenue for a report of two people fighting over the whereabouts of a lost vape pen. Mm -mm. Now, vaping's legal. Yes. So you can call the cops to help uh, figure out a fight between people fighting over a vapor pen. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I don't know. I just don't. Me know. neither. Now, Greeley police... They need to see the reenactors. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? Mm. Delineators. Police responded to 27th Avenue and C Street <laughs> for a report of an intoxicated woman dancing in her window and flipping off the neighbors. Uh, so, not only was she dancing, but she was giving neighbors the finger and, and various obscene gestures. I'm, you know, I'm, it is just time for Kay Norton to put some shutters <laughs> on the windows. Oh, God. Little UNC joke there, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. Let's do another old-timey. Shall we? We shall. The Pawnee Buttes area. Wow. I only wish it were pronounced the way it's spelled, Pawnee Buttes, but it's Pawnee, Pawnee Buttes area, mm -hmm. thanks to visits from college professors, has become known as the land... Of the three-toed horse. What? As they say, I shall repeat that. Three-toed horse? Land of the three-toed horse. What does that mean? Horse. I three, don't know horse. Horse with three toes. I don't know light horse uh, husbandry. Fossils of the horse have apparently been found everywhere in the Buttes mm. area. How? Ooh. They must have been like doing archaeology or anthropology. Do, do horses have five of their, or maybe only four? I don't know. I thought they had just a hoof. Right. Well, the horse has know. thingies. What do you want me to ask? How many hoofs a horse has? Or how many ho things on a toes on a horse's okay. hoof? How many toes? Okay. Yeah. How many toes on a horse's how hoof? How many toes does a horse have? Um, how many toes does a horse have? Well, I've got to type it. You just the type answer, it. my friend, is on my wife's phone. I can do it. How? And the answer may have to do with the horse's bones. Many Let's see. Toes. On a horse, or, or on one hoof. As a horse. And you know these uh, jokes about horse hooves can't be beat. Horses and rhinoceros are odd-toed. In fact, horses have only one toe on each foot. But they believe uh, thousands of years ago they began with five. Oh, wow. So those are prehistoric. So genetic... Lessening, because <coughs> okay. oh, so maybe now most horses have yeah. Odd, well, odd they would have be one. odd would be three. Oh, now they have one. Yeah, they began with five, and then. But three. this is only a hundred years ago. What the hell? I was genetic. Uh, they lost their toes. What? Uh, maybe tight shoes. Tight shoes. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, but I'm saying like you know the, these this evolution thing is supposed to take thousands of years, not a few decades. Yeah, maybe he goes from three. It's toes. like a different a different type of horses. I guess. Boy, oh boy. Well, how do they know. do ballet? Not well. They have to keep redesigning horse toe shoes. That's that's pretty That'd sad. That'd be cute. A Canadian. Oh, Nancy says great shirt. Thank you, Nancy. I like it too. Oh yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is how, folks who are watching at home. I see this as kind of blue, white, and grayish. Is there any green in this? It does have a green look. Because I need to wear a green item of clothing. Uh, tomorrow, I think we're going to a, a thing that, that requires some green in yes. it. Yes. So, I don't, unfortunately, as much as I do like this shirt, I don't think there's, it's very greenish. I'm going to hold it up to the, the thing. Nah, I'm, not, I'm not, not feeling green on this shirt. Every other possible color. Let's see, a little bit more of Greeley Crimes and Old Times. A Canadian citizen visiting Greeley enlisted in the British Army. And he was given $2 in pay and transported to Denver. But... He did not check into the British offices, uh -oh. and he left for the two bucks. He was later arrested. Police later said, or said they found him mm -hmm. in a ragged, dirty condition. <laughs> oh no! And yeah. was was skirmishing vigorously for cooties. <laughs> 
<laughs> what the heck does that mean? Didn't they have cootie shots back then? But from cooties or for cooties? For cooties. You know, he was probably looking over himself. Did they call <laughs> lice or chiggers cooties? I'm going to ask what are well, cooties. Cooties, I thought they were fake. You, you know, when you were in second grade, he said, I got the somebody would punch you in the arm and give you a cootie shot. That was the, the joke of it. I didn't know cooties were a thing. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. What are cooties? Here's the definition of cootie. A body louse. Oh, it was a lot. It was a body so they call them cooties. Children. Back then. It's also a name for um, like a fake children's yeah, thing. But, but a... that's it. So he's he's searching. He's skirmishing. What a great word. He is skirmishing vigorously for cooties. Body lice associated yeah. with lice. Oh. I know. When I was in my twenties, I skirmished vigorously for cougars, but that's a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? Here's some images. Image. Oh, I don't, I don't want to see images of lice. I really don't. Oh, oh, that's excellent. I do yeah. want to see that. Let me let me throw that up for the folks on our... our yeah. <laughs> there they are. It says they're gray, they're bloodsuckers. I'll explain it. Oh, they're kind of coot. It says <laughs> they coot, are coot, gray, coot. they're bloodsuckers, they live in blankets and clothing, oh. they lay eggs or knits in clothing. Oh. If you do not get rid of them, you will be unpopular and a candidate for the hospital. Ooh. Um, your clothing needs to be sterilized, get a new identity card, treat... Um, pubic and crotch hairs oh. daily, Ooh. and yeah. armpits, yeah. and to go to a delousing station and report your friends. What? To report your friends? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So lice are bad. Yeah. Why would, why would lice ultimately put you in the hospital? If you don't treat them. Well, you just get itchy. Do they mm -hmm. actually start taking so much blood that you... I don't have know. blood loss or is there a disease that they carry? I I don't know. I never had the cooties. I was cootie free. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm cootie free, so. Yeah. I wonder if anybody's tried to eat fried lice. You know, this this fried right there's the the Chinese thing, but if they're so small, but they get millions of them. I guess they could be bred. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. Oh wait. Remind Nancy about your dentist. Your dentist. Why? Oh, well, I, I will say, I think Nancy was on here when I mentioned that I got a clean... Oh, oh, do the, do the drill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny. When they did the electric, you know, polishing brush... The electric brush, boogaloo? <laughs> <laughs> the electric slide? Well, I was at the dentist, and they used the electric thing. It felt fine. No blood. I didn't bleed at all at the dentist. Good. It was great. My gums were in good shape again. But... When they went in manually and started pulling at the pulp and in the in between, yeah. I was like, ah! So I still have some work to do, you know? Oh. I thought, because when you went to the, this is hilarious, Joyce went to the dentist uh, a couple of weeks ago. She was out in 10 minutes yeah, that's true. after her cleaning. Literally, 10 minutes, zoop, 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 poke, poke. Me, I go in there, they tell me I'm doing great, I'm in good shape, no cavities, and they, they do the electric, and then they're in there, and they're pulling, and they're tugging, and they're scraping, and they're gluing, and they're, you know, sending shockwaves through my body. <sighs> you love being tortured by ladies. You're just, you're so competitive, you even won at Woo! dentistry. <laughs> All right, let's do a couple more, because you have to go down to the parking lot and see your friend. Uh, oh, yes, I yeah. also have to go to the loo. Oh. So it's a two-parter. Yeah, well, we don't have a toilet in here, but mm -hmm. we might have... Um... No, I need to go. Oh, they, they, took, they took away my bucket. Oh, well. Sometimes I'm, I'm sitting breaking papers. I don't want to get up. Oh, God. <laughs> Anywho. Uh, police responded to a retail business on 47th Avenue for a report of a man possibly huffing cans. Oh, like paint. How do you huff? How do you do that? Do you just yeah, you, you sp are you spraying it? it or no, you, you sniff it. You like put it in your face and you sniff. You suck your nose hair All in. All right. Uh, and you know the the woman whose cans he was huffing pulled her pants up when the police arrived. But and you know HR huffing stuff, puffing <laughs> stuff. Oh, I like that. I do like that. Uh, let's see. He, what what house will he belong to? Hufflepuff. In Harry, Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. That's Hufflepuff. right. Hufflepuff. I got to put in on Harry my Potter. Thing. You have to put what in? My, not in on my thing. Put on your thing. I don't even Thank know what you're saying there. Uh, let's do one, one oh, more. Oh, no, no. What? No, no. <laughs> no, no. Okay. I got issues, honey. All right, you know, let's do one more really crime, 
And then yeah. I'll do a little please sponsorship thing. Please release me. And let me go. We're on to the rest of this program. I'm itchy. Animal. I think I have cooties now. Oh, we didn't do this last week. This oh, is the perfect one to end with. Animal control officers uh -oh. responded to 21st Street and 18th Avenue for a report of a raccoon that jumped off the caller's second story roof. We talked about this together. I don't think yeah. we did this on the show. Um, where, where, where? Was it a raccoon suicide? I wonder. I wonder. Maybe he was watching Anthony Bourdain and he said, you know, what am I doing this for? Or kids Spain. Bord Bourdain gets to eat all this great food. I'm rooting through garbage. Yeah. Uh, I have to wear glasses permanently. My eyes are always Aww. in black. He's like, I'm, I'm just going to end things. Mm. So the caller told dispatchers the raccoon was living in one of her walls with baby raccoons. And she was worried the mom, I think we did talk about this last mm -hmm. week. She was worried the mama raccoon might be injured and be separated from her babies. So it was just the, I think we talked about last week that there was one guy who wanted to shoot a prairie dog no, in his window. but now those babies are in, in a separate happy, happy, happy raccoon baby camp. Thanks to Krigger Giggers. Yes, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Krigger Giggers and Donald Trump sent them to a, a camp. But it's just kind of nice that this is a neighbor yeah. pretty close to us, cares about the mama and the baby raccoons. It's not like, let's poison it, let's kill it. But uh, I, uh, having raccoons living in your wall, I can indeed love you so. Give me a moment, folks. I have to hug the missus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Sexy, sexy. Is hug. Oh. I love you. Have, have, a, good show have a great time. Gonna, I'll be back in a second. Okay. Um... That was my darling and adorable wife, Joyce, who joins me for the first hour or so of every episode of Dave's Gone By. So we've done Greeley Crimes at all times. Yay! Are we done with the cool stuff on this radio program of the stream? And by the way, did you see that moth flying around there? Um, we have so much more to do on this great program. We've got, of course, our special guest coming up, Wilson Germain Heredia, the Tony Wing guy from Rent. He was also on Broadway in La Cage, and he's in a new off-Broadway musical, kind of a workshop of a musical, that's part of the New York Musical Festival happening in July. He's Wilson Germain Heredia. He'll be with us in just a little while, talking to the one and only and Jewish Rabbi Saul Solomon. Plus, we'll have a Saturday segue of songs in the news. Plus, we'll have a Colorado limerick of the damned, and we'll be going to Avon in this particular Colorado limerick. What else? Did I mention everything? Uh, story time with a cow for Hansel. Yes, we're still doing a friggin' cow for Hansel. And Dave's Big Dick Shinary, where the word Joyce has chosen for me is bluefish. Bluefish. I mean, if she done blowfish, I can make some jokes, but bluefish... That'll be on Dave's Big Dictionary coming up. So all of that I do before we get to our next segment, which I might as well get our iTunes ready for. Oh, I already did. Yay for me. Oh, it's good to be prepared. But, um, hmm. Am I thinking? Oh, yeah. Our sponsors. How could I forget our wonderful sponsors? Hewlett Minuteman Press, the copy kings of Broadway in Hewlett, Long Island, for... Wow, it's almost about 40 years now. Is it 87, 97, 07? More than 40 years. The Torong family has owned and operated Hewlett Minuteman right in the heart of Hewlett, Long Island. It's across the street from the enormous Petco that they've got there. There are a couple of banks right on the corners. Minuteman moved a few months ago, but it was just a building or two over. So they're really still in the same place, right in the heart of Unit Long Island. But the main thing is, if you have copying that you need done, whether it's single-sided black and white, or double-sided, or color copies, or you need things bound, or laminated, or spiral bound, or if you have a company, an organization, and you want your logo on an item of clothing, on perhaps a potato, or anything a banner, a balloon, uh, a sporting good item. Hewlett Minuteman can help you. And they're also really well known for holiday cards and wedding invitations. So on Monday, give them a buzz. 516-569-5577 is the number. Erico 516-569-5577. And if you tell them Dave sent you, 
you get 10% off any job, big or small, at Hewlett Minuteman Press. They are the copy kings. Love don't, you, babe. Don't forget to save your audio oh, file. Oh, save my audio file, you want yeah. Me to make a note? No, I've, I've got it's, it's recording, but so you I know that. Save it. Yeah. Gracias, babe. Love you. Have a great time. I'll see you in a little bit. And I'll see you guys still here for a while because we're just getting started with all the fun in the neighborhood. Now, you know, since we're having a Tony Award winner coming up on this broadcast, that I'm kind of into the theater, which is why every week we do a segment called Inside Broadway. Inside Broadway, a look at theater on and off Broadway and beyond. Brought to you by Total Theater and Performing Arts Insider. Curtain going up. Da da do da 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 yeah. Inside Broadway we go, and not a lot of Broadway news this week. It's kind of a, this might be a fairly short-ish segment because you know after the Tonys there's this um, everybody everything ramps up to all oh, the Tony Awards, the Tony winners, and what's going to play and what's going to get millions of dollars and stuff, and then. You know, there, there's this die down. The producers all go on vacations. They get far away from New York for a while, and there's not a lot of shows opening, so it mellows out a bit. But hey, Broadway still goes on. Now, how did the Tonys do? I uh, didn't get a chance to mention this last week. The Tonys were up just a little bit, a tiny notch in the ratings from the year before. But hey, that's better than the Tonys have been doing for the past few years. So with uh, Sarah Bareilles and Josh Groban hosting, they did bring in some new people. They had Har Harry Potter also and Frozen up for awards and SpongeBob SquarePants. So they're, they're, they reached a somewhat wider demographic perhaps this year than they have in recent years. It also didn't hurt that there was no basketball game. That night, because the Tonys invariably wind up on a Sunday night where it's either the fifth or the sixth or the seventh game of the NBA playoffs. And this year, they didn't have to worry about it. It was just, I think it was a hockey game, but somehow the hockey demographic and the Broadway demographic don't always kind of mesh. So they did a little better this year, which is really, really nice. And how have Broadway shows been doing since the Tonys two weeks ago? Well, they've been doing really, really well. Because Broadway is a money machine at the moment, and has been for a while. So the Tony winning revival Angels in America popped up just under a million dollars this week, which is amazing money for a non-musical on Broadway. Harry Potter hit $2.3 million. I mean, it's the most expensive play ever on Broadway, but they'll, they'll make their money back, believe me. And... Um, a show that I loved, the musical The Bang's Visit, which won 10 Tony Awards back on June 10th. That show is now um, up over a million dollars. It's actually been making good money even before the Tonys, but now it's really like a thing. So congratulations to our friend of the neighborhood, David Yazbek, who is the composer of The Bang's Visit. He's, he's going to be set for life on this show, so congratulations. And even, this is really cool, even shows that didn't do well at the Tonys are doing really, really well at the box office over the summer. For example, SpongeBob SquarePants, which, you know, that was in the $500,000, $600,000 a week range, which is struggling for a musical. Last week, the show hit 960000 bucks at the box office. So I'm sure the Squidward dance on the Tonys helped a bit, and the fact that kids are out of school you know, between now and early August helps too. Mean Girls, which got skunked at the Tonys, which was a big shock because people just assumed that Tina Fey would walk away with the, uh, the award for best book. She didn't. The Bang's Visit got it. But Mean Girls is still doing just fine. It's breaking box office records at its theater and made $1.6 million last week. My Fair Lady, which did not win, uh, I think, anything uh, and was shown on the Tonys to fairly good effect. I think, but they're rocking at Lincoln Center. They made 1.3 mil last week. The Tony Wing Play Revival, Three Tall Women, 
That bounced over a million bucks, and it's only another two weeks to see that show on Broadway, so make tracks. Uh, and let's see, even the old guard, the shows that have been running a while, they're still monsters. For example, Wicked made nearly two million. Lion King was over two million. Hamilton, three million. Book of Mormon, 1.2 mil. Overall, ticket sales hit $39.2 million for the week, up even a little bit over the week before, which was the week right after the Tony Awards, and up over 16% from a year ago for the same week. So Broadway doing rather well, thank you, uh, even in the summertime, which is supposed to be doldrums. Uh, th th that's quite amazing. So congratulations to the Broadway League, at least financially, on that. I want to let you know about a musical that opened and is now closing this weekend, and it's not Broadway, it's an off-Broadway musical, but check out the people involved. The show is called The Beast in the Jungle, and it's, it's a dance hybrid musical. book is by David Thompson. The music is by John Kander. Now, this is the guy of Kander and Ebb, the guy who co-wrote Cabaret, Chicago, Zorba the Greek, The Happy Time, um, The Scottsboro Boys. I mean, John Kander Still working on musicals, and he wrote or worked on this one called The Beast in the Jungle. He wrote the musical, the music for it, and the show is directed and choreographed by Susan Stroman, right? So, wow. It's ending Sunday after its world premiere at the Vineyard Theater off Broadway. Now, the show is based on a story by Henry James, all about this troubled man who has an unrequited love story that spans various decades. Reviews were admittedly mixed. There, people, the critics found a lot of things to love about the show, but they were also, the story was sort of meh. And you know that your piece has some book trouble when one critic says that it's too talky, it's just blah blah, too much dialogue, and another critic saw the same show and said that he wished they had more dialogue and less overall music and dance in it. So, you know, that, that something's a little bit amiss, but a lot of people responded to the visual imagery and the captur captivating dance. For example, our friend of the neighborhood, Joe Demangowitz with the New York Daily News wrote, the show is easy to admire for its ambition, experimentation, and fine performances, but it's a mixed bag. It won't leave you with anything resembling a contact high. This is a bit of a play on words, because, of course, Susan Stroman really came to the fore as the director and choreographer of Contact, which was a dance musical of these different one acts that were mostly nonverbal. Um, and and Stro later, of course, went on to direct and choreograph The Producers. That was a, a big, of course, claim to fame for her. But anyway, The Beast in the Jungle, whether that's going to have a further life, hard to say at this point. I don't know if, at least in the condition that it's in, if it's necessarily Broadway ready, according to the critics' reviews of the show at the Vineyard Theater. Now, oh, I did mention, I'm sorry, when I mentioned uh, Three Tall Women, and said you have all this extra time to see it, like another week or two. I was wrong. This is it for the terrific, and I say this because I saw the show, uh, the terrific Broadway revival of Three Tall Women featuring Glenda Jackson, Alison Pill, and Laurie Metcalf, directed by Joe Mantello. It's the revival of a show that won the Pulitzer for Edward Albee about 20-something years ago. It was the show that revived his career, revived his status. He'd written a bunch of really bad plays, and then suddenly this came along and everybody recognized, wow, this is really, really good. And it's still, I think it's even maybe better now than it was 20-something years ago, or maybe I'm just older, and respond to it a little differently. But you have only until tomorrow to see Three Tall Women on Broadway at the John Golden Theater. So, and, you know, this is Glenda Jackson's return to the New York stage after about 25 years, and she's wonderful. Uh, the, the character is hateful and scary, but also touching and funny, and, and you got to see her. Alison Pill's good, too. Metcalf's good. I mean, see Three Tall Women. You can see it this matinee tonight, and then they got one more show tomorrow, and then it's over. So... I'm just telling you, yeah, 
you know what? Run, do not walk, see three tall women if you can still somehow get a ticket. Closing this weekend on Broadway. You know, we couldn't do this segment, this inside Broadway segment about the theater without the help of our wonderful friends at Total Theater. This is a website that has, well, totaltheater.com is a website of theater reviews, articles, and interviews. And you can see it just by going to totaltheater.com for free. And there are thousands of theater reviews online there, including shows still running on, off, and off, off Broadway and regional theater, international theater, festivals. Just go surfing. Just go poking through. As a matter of fact, sometimes the, um, the search engine on the homepage is a little bit buggy. That's okay. Just go to the What's New page, and there's now a new link where you can have links to all the reviews of shows over the past two and a half years. We're adding more and more until we get to, hopefully at some point, the last or, or the earliest review that was ever posted on the site. You'll be able to find it. Right now, we just have the last two and a half years. So click on that link, or on the What's New page is just a list of hyperlinks to reviews of all the shows that are still currently running in New York, in America, and around the world. Total Theater. Dot com. Now, Total Theater also puts out a journal, a journal that has been around since 1944, and this is a place that people in the entertainment industry go when they need to know, hey, I, I need all the inside detailed information on every show on, off, and off, off Broadway. It's called Performing Arts Insider. So, yeah, there's a table of contents in the beginning, there's an index in the back, but there's comprehensive listings, whether it's Escape to Margaritaville or Angels in America or Wicked or The Lion King, just all the folks involved, the actors, the directors, the designers, the creators. Plus, how do you get in touch with these folks? Well, the agents, the managers, the stage managers, the production stage managers, and emails, contact information. Sometimes you can even get directly to a writer or designer or performer just through their email or phone number or their agent's number. This is not readily available information that you can just go on a website or two or find. Some of it is, a lot of it isn't. You need that in the pages of Performing Arts Insider, the Bible of Broadway since 1944. How to find out more? Go to artsinsider.com. It is a hard copy magazine. It does come out in your mailbox to you 21 times a year, or you can just go for the monthly issue. But to find out how to subscribe or to send away for a single issue, just go to performingartsinsider.com. And if you happen to be in New York, you can pick up a single issue at the Drama Bookshop and also Theater Circle in Midtown Manhattan. But either way, check out Performing Arts Insider. It is the Bible of... Broadway. Well, returning to Broadway, there was a bit of new potential musical Broadway news, and we're going to end the segment with that. Will audiences find this show bad or a thriller? Or will they say, be it? Yes, there's going to be a musical that's now in development. It doesn't have a title yet, but it's going to be based on the musical catalog of Michael Jackson, and it's eyed for Broadway in 2020. Now, the good news is that Lynn Noggage, one of our most respected playwrights, is doing the book for this musical. So it's probably not going to be a hash job and just shoehorning a bunch of songs into a crap story or a crap biography of Michael Jackson. The perhaps bad news is that the musical has the blessing of, not just the blessing of, but is being co-produced by the Jackson estate. So, um, don't know if they're going to... Maybe they'll mention Bubbles. Maybe the little chamber that Michael used to sleep in. Whether they'll talk about, oh, I don't know, his relationship with younger folks. I'm sure they'll mention it. Mm, you know what I'm, I'm hinting at. Don't know if this new Michael Jackson musical that is first being worked on will go there. The interesting thing is um, when they when they put out the press release about this upcoming show, I went to all that chat for readers' comments, and the comments included, well, you know, in um, 
In the Cher musical, there's going to be three actresses playing Cher. The Donna Summer musical that's on Broadway now, Summer, that has three actresses playing Donna Summer. He's saying, why not there be have there be five actors playing Michael Jackson, and will they be called the Jackson Five? Very clever. And then <laughs> another person wrote in, will there be a matinee Bubbles? I like that. And someone wrote in, Michael and Latoya should be played by the same person. Another person wrote in, go away, pop star bios on Broadway. Go away. You know, some of them are Jersey Boys. Some of them are good. Some of them are good vibrations and not so good. It remains to be seen whether the, as of now, untitled Michael Jackson musical will, which camp that will fall into. But, you know, doesn't hurt to play a little reminder of why Michael Jackson was considered by many the king of pop and why he was so important culturally and musically. Let's hear one of his songs, or at least a piece of it before Facebook cuts me off, Black or White. My name is Wilson Germain Heredia, and I'm talking to Rabbi Saul Solomon at Dave's Gone By. Oh, shalom, damn it! This is your pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, here with you on the radio. Oh, I'm flying. Look at me, I'm a Jew. Maybe you are, maybe you, yes. I'm flying because we're going to be talking about a show called Pedro Pan. No, it's not a Spanish translation of Peter Pan. It's a musical that they're going to be doing in July as part of the New York Musicals Festival. It's all about immigrant children, so it's very much in the news. But we're going to be talking to somebody who's in it. Somebody who won a Tony Award for being in one of the iconic modern musicals of modern times, Rent. He's also been on Broadway in La Caja Fall. He's done some other off-Broadway work. So, I can't wait to talk to Wilson Germain Aredia in the neighborhood. And here he is with us now. Hola and shalom, Wilson. <laughs> All and shalom to you too, Rabbi. Now, I may have mispronounced, see, you, your last name starts with an H. Is it Heredia or Heredia? It's actually both correct. If you're pronouncing it in English, it's Heredia. If it's in Spanish, it's Heredia. So you actually said it correctly the first time. Yeah, but that just makes it more confusing. Which, do, do, you, do you have a preference? Heredia. Heredia. Heredia with an H. Heredia. Okay, so we'll get hereditary here with Wilson Germain. So, this it's, is really exciting. You've got a new musical that you are in. It's at the Musicals Festival starting on July 10th. It's only five performances, but people can see it right in Midtown at the Acorn Theater running from the 10th through the 14th of July. Tell us, please, about Pedro Pan. Ah, yes, I'm very, very excited to be part of this project, Pedro Pan. It is about the Cuban Revolution and the displaced children that were sent to the United States during the time in order to protect them from the soldiers from being conscripted into the army. It's the story of the, the heartache and the pain and, and all the complications and the ins and the outs that come with that. It's very heartbreaking, but also a great time and it's also informative it does everything that a musical should do you should be you should leave with with a feeling that you've been informed and you've been entertained um, i wish people would uh, leave that from my sermons but they never do it's kind of a, kind of sad there you've been rehearsing this show this musical pedro pan as you've been doing it of course in the news all over the place everybody's talking about the border and the immigrants and the children and the camps since reading the script first probably months ago, from doing it now, are there moments in rehearsal when you come to a line and you go, oh boy, that's a headline today, that you didn't half a year ago? Yeah, yeah, d oh, definitely. I mean, there are some parts more around the beginning where he is at, at immigration and how he's treated more at immigration when, when he's in Cuba. But also, it's a very, very weird time that as much as we talk about protecting children, when it all comes down to it, when the cards are down, people really don't care about children. They use them as a weapon, something in order to get something done. It's just very, very, very timely what's going on. And so funny, even more so, last year it didn't leave a dry eye in the audience. But this year, with everything that's been going on, it's definitely, definitely one of those things that makes you think and great thing is that the story is through the perspective of this child, and it shows you the, the human side, because very much
people's humanity, so it makes it a lot easier to abuse them. And this, it actually humanizes all the characters and all the parts of it, all the sides of what's going on. So hopefully, even with this small little show, I, I hope that, very much like Rent, that it's the little voice that could, that eventually everyone catches on. Hmm. By the way, I'm going to make the worst pun that you have heard in the past couple of weeks right now. You used the word diminish, and this is uh, important to that show. You don't want to see things diminished. And yet, <laughs> your ancestry is diminishkin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's horrible. But, well, Very nice. <laughs> What, what does it mean to you? I know we're, we're, we're flipping gears right here, but uh, what does your Dominican ancestry mean to you? How does it manifest in your family life and your daily life? Well, I, mean, I was born here. You can say that I'm actually more American than I am Dominican now uh, since, since I was born here. But uh, I didn't really start learning English until I was properly, until I was around six years old, because I lived in a very provincial kind of neighborhood in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which is now the new hipster mecca. But prior to that, it was primarily mostly all Latin in order to acclimate to American culture. Very much like Pedro Pan, acclimating to uh, American culture was was weird. And uh, I I didn't realize that being Dominican was was something different until I was told that in school. And there are some scenes in, in this show also where the kids are cruel because of where Pedro comes from. For me, it's, but being of Dominican culture, I mean, I feel that every single day. It's just one of those things that you kind of uh, carry in your soul. There's the music, there's the food, there's the people, there's the way that you that you treat other people. So for me, it's a very, very important thing to keep that because it is part of my identity. It's not all of my identity, but it's a huge part of my identity. It's my foundations. That makes uh, complete sense. Are, are your parents gone? Are they still? No, they're still alive, thank God. Ah. They are still alive. And they, they have moved back to the Dominican Republic. But they let me know how, how difficult it was when they were coming up here before I was born and after I was born. And I was able to see some of the firsthand experiences that, that they were going through, how they had to learn the language, the kind of jobs that they were able to get, how much they struggled, how important family was, how important family still is. And everything that you do is for family. Again, very much like how everything's going on right now, the, the political and social climate, that people wonder, well, why are they putting these kids in the middle of all this? Why take these kids and put them in danger? Why sacrifice all that? Because everything that you do is for your children. It's just one of those things that we should all remember. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. At the end of the day, it's elevating the next generation. One thing about elevating the generation is despite your parents' struggles and having to take certain jobs because that's all they could get, it sounds like they encouraged you to go into one of the most unsafe, quote-unquote, careers of all, which is music and also the arts. (laughs) Well, they did. They inadvertently inspired me to do that because it was all around us. My father always had instruments around the house. There were percussion instruments, string instruments, but they wanted me to become a doctor. And so that's, that's what I had my eyes set on doing. But I knew from a very young age that a performer was what I was going to be. And as the universe would have it, it put me in the right place at the right time. And I was prepared for it. Well, did you study theater in college or, what, uh, or were you in med school? I didn't go to med school. I, I actually went to art school when I decided, I decided that I was going to go headlong into this career when I was in my last year of high school. I, I went to a, a vocational high school where I came out a medical assistant uh, and I worked in a couple of hospitals and I worked in a clinic and it was one of those things that I absolutely knew that it was time to tell my parents, like, hey, it's, it's time. So after that, I went to Hunter College, and I got into their film and theater program, and so that's what I studied. I I did it all on my own. Actually, my parents insisted that I pay my way through it, and I did. So I had odd jobs, and so I struggled for it, very much like how my parents struggled for what they have. They encouraged me to do that for myself, and I appreciate it completely for that. It was, in, in some respects, it could be considered as hard love, but it was the appropriate thing to do because now I understand what it is to struggle for your own dreams and your own desires and aspirations. 
Well, did you do that thing that a lot of actors do when they come out of college and they say, okay, I'm going to be an actor, I'm going to do it. But I give myself five years. And if I'm not at least self-supporting in four and a half, then I'll go into, I'll be a secretary, I'll wipe old people's tushies for a living. When I decided that I was going to be an actor, I claimed it from the very beginning. And I was very fortunate to already have a manager by the time that I was in my first year of Hunter College. Whoa. And I had received my equity card within the very first semester of being at Hunter College. I was working with Elizabeth Suedos in this show called The New Americans. I was, again, I was in the right place at the right time. I was prepared for it, and the universe said, are you ready for it? Yes, I am, and it threw me headlong into it. So I was one of the very few students in my class that was actually working professionally. Oh, that's it, because a lot of people would look at you and go, oh, well, nobody's heard of you until, of course, Rent came along, and that changed everything. I didn't realize that even before Rent, you were getting off-Broadway credits. You were getting, uh, you know, your equity card, working with Elizabeth Suedos, for gosh. Do you have any memories of her? She seemed like a very special person. Oh, yes, she, she was. I, I can tell you honestly, because it was my first gig, I was terrified of her because she was so serious about, about the craft and her craft and how she expected her actors to comport themselves. So I was terrified, but I was in awe of her talent and, and awe of her vision. The one thing that I can take away from it is that she instilled with me a feeling of that this craft is not just for fame. It's not for riches. It's actually if you are in love with the craft itself. And that's all. Uh, not just musical theater, but theater, film, television, that you have to take it seriously. And that's the first thing that you have to keep in mind. And, and the thing that is most important is that. And that not all projects have to be blockbusters. They don't have to be commercial successes. As long as you actually reach out and communicate something and inform someone. Again, well, for me, it was amazing to be around that kind of talent. And it's, it's inspired me ever since then. And made me feel that, wow, you know, I can write too. I can definitely write too. She, she has just a, had a great, great, fantastic method. Uh, and, and I miss her. I definitely, I miss her talent and, and I miss her presence in the world. Well, are you on the toilet there? What is that noise behind you there? Oh, I'm outside. I, I'm taking a walk outside in, in my, my little area. There's a helicopter above. Oh, and I was wondering, there was a gurgling sound. I thought you were flushing, but it's, it's actually a toilet. And you're, and you're not in flushing. You're with us on the, the radio, on the Dave's Gong by radio program of the stream with me, Rabbi Sal Solomon, talking to Wilson Germain Heredia. We're now up to the point when I, I think it's said, well, you know, you auditioned for something, you were hoping to get it because it was 300 bucks a week, and this little show was at New York Theater Workshop. What was the name of it again? I think it was called Lease. Oh, Lease! Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. Uh, which they eventually changed. Jonathan Larson did to Rent. Do you remember what you did to audition for Rent? Oh, absolutely. For one, I was dressed in overalls. I had a goatee and combat boots. And I sang Great Balls of Fire and Amazing Grace. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I didn't, for one thing, I didn't think of myself as a musical theater actor. I didn't study that. I studied everything separately. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to give it a go. I don't think that they're going to hire me anyway. I was surprised that they gave me the demo tape so that way I can learn overnight. Mm -hmm. And audition with it the next day so it was <laughs> it was a shock i mean it threw me into the musical theater world uh, it, which i never thought did it occur to you that the role that they gave you of angel i mean did you think you would get roger or did, did you have any idea what you were auditioning for oh yeah i knew that i was auditioning for angel ah, okay. uh, i knew but i the other job that i had i wasn't again because i didn't really think that i was going to get it uh, I thought, well, I, I'm not going to shave for this, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to go all out of my way for this. If they like what I can do, you know, then I'll make the adjustments later on. And luckily, that's, that's actually what happened. Did they ever tell you what it was about you that they saw that they said, aha, uh -huh, you? Um, I don't know. I mean, that you would have to ask them. <laughs> well, I can't ask Jonathan Larson for obvious reasons, but, you know. Well, I do have an interesting story. See, uh, the, the first day that I was supposed to audition, I overslept and I didn't show up for the very first audition because I was working from 12 to 9 o'clock in the morning. It was mm. a graveyard shift. So I decided I had enough time that I'd be able to take at least a half hour nap and then go to the audition. Instead, you know, I woke up at, I don't know, like it was like 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. My agent at that time, God bless his soul, his name is Fritz Callister. He reamed me in. Like, he 
character. So I was very, very, uh, to, to say the least, uh, I was sort of like a days ago about it. It was like, all right, fine, I'll, you know, I'll show up. And so next day, they arrange for another audition, and I go. And the first thing I do when I walk in the room, there's Michael Greif, there's Bernie Telsey, uh, there's Marlies. And I say, I'm sorry, I have this job. And Jonathan Larson comes up from behind me, and he said, it's okay, I wasn't here either yesterday because I was working too. <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh, oh perfect. And so it, set, it definitely set the stage. And he recognized I'm a working guy, he's a working guy too, uh, and yet are you still inspired to pursue your art? And then I started to sing. So I think me not showing up uh, the day before and, and me being there on that day with Jonathan Larson definitely set it in stone for me. They liked what I did. And when I sang Cover You the next day, it was Cover You and, and Today for You. The singing in that way, uh, it, it's very different than uh, using my natural voice. Right. It's different from Great Balls of Fire also, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, completely, completely different. And so I didn't know how to, how to, and mind you, I was not a trained singer. I was self-taught, and so I sang in rock bands in, in college. So it was a very, very different approach to, to vocalizing in that musical theater. Tim Weil, the fantastic musical director that he is, he was able to recognize the quality and the tone of my voice, and he said, why don't you sing like little Stevie Wonder? Uh, try that and see if we can get through that. And so I didn't have to worry about how, for those people out there that are familiar with uh, singing terminology, it, it's a placement. I had to figure out what, what a placement was. I started, instead of going, live in my house, I'll be your shelter. It became, live in my house, I'll be your shelter. Oh my God, that's... And, <laughs> you get asked to uh, imitate Stevie Wonder at parties? <laughs> Uh, no, no. I you don't, should. I don't, but I, I should, I guess, right? Yeah, I heard it, but but I hear also that what you're saying about it's not musical theater singing, which you found the one show at that time that was looking for something very different from musical yes. theater built and yes. guest voice and Ethel Merman and et cetera. Yeah. Right, right. And once you put that into my head, then I was able to navigate that song and navigate all the other songs. And also... I was able to find Angel's voice as well, uh, how he expressed himself vocally. From there on, it was it was just an evolution over over the years. The longer I did it, the the more evolved the character became, the more solid and more of a real person he became. Yeah, it was it was definitely a trip. It was for me the whole time. It was a learning experience. I had to learn how to perform as a musical theater person as opposed to a straight actor, which is what I thought my, my life was going to be. It was just going to be, I fancied myself very much like uh, Raul Julia, and mm. that time also the other people that I admired was like you know, Robert De Niro, Pacino, and so forth. Those are the people that I grew up watching. Uh, I didn't have a lot of experience going to the theater because I didn't have access to that either. All I had was the television. And so one of my first loves is, you know, West Side Story, yeah. Seven Brides and Seven Brothers, anything that, that, that I was able to watch on television. So that was my experience. And between Michael Greif, the cast, Jonathan, Tim Wilde, musical director, they gave me, it, it was a master class. I would have to say it was a master class in musical theater, and but also very specific. And it wasn't really until like a lot, the last 10 years that I really found an appreciation, a complete appreciation for, for musical theater as a whole when I played Lancelot in, in Camelot in San Francisco Theater. I found this love, like, I, you know, I really do love classical musical theater. I, I love that stuff. So if it weren't for that, I, I don't think that I'd be where I am today. I know that I wouldn't be where I am today because of it. And, in every sense of the word, not just as far as career, but as, as far as being informed and appreciation of these things that otherwise I wouldn't be exposed to. Now, not to wallow in the story that you must have told 450 million times, but we all know the story of Rent. Well, it was the final dress rehearsal for Off-Broadway of yeah. Rent. Mm -hmm. Did you get a phone call in the morning of the, the next performance, or was it after the show? When did you get the horrible news? And just take us through that day, as I'm sure you've done four billion times. Okay, and this will be a billion and one. 
Yeah. Uh, like you said, we had our final dress rehearsal. It was our first, really, actually, it was our first complete dress. For me, it was the first time that I think that I got that character right because I was still trying to figure out where the character sat and also within the whole environment of the show and how to do it right, it, for, for lack of a better phrase, just how to get it right. And I felt that I finally, finally got it right. And I felt like I was in it. I was in the zone. Jonathan was very happy. Michael Greif was very happy. And Jesse Martin was saying, like, yeah, you were great tonight. I was like, yeah, I felt like I was in the zone. You were great, too. And, and so it was, it was a great night. And as we were stepping out of the theater and New York Theater Workshop downtown, uh, I can see that Jonathan Larson was being interviewed by the New York Times. He looked just just beyond happy. He looked very satisfied finally. His, his baby has, has actually materialized. Go home and thinking like, okay, tomorrow is the first preview. And I wake up to my phone ringing and it's Jim Nicola and he says, and he gives us the bad news. He gives me the bad news and he, and he says that Jonathan passed the night before that apparently he went home and the guy's famous story is, is he was making a pot of tea and, uh, and then he just died there on the spot. That was just not the best way to wake up. Uh, not, the, not the best way yeah. to wake up. It just wasn't. And, of course, the question was, what are we going to do? But they asked all of us to go to the theater as soon as we all could. So we all went. And we were all just kind of, you know, con uh, consoling each other and hugging each other and crying and, and uh, asking questions. And, and so the, the big question was, obviously, what are we going to do? So it just became an invited first preview with all of the friends and family. We were doing it more like a stage reading with, with our scripts there, even though that we had everything committed to memory. But it was just going to be kind of like a, a very simple reading um, where we sang the songs, sort of like a concert version of it. And by the time that we got to La Viva Wem, Daphne, Ruben Vega, and I couldn't contain ourselves during the handcrafted beers portion of La Viva Wem, and we just completely cut loose. And the we went into complete, complete staging and choreography and blocking, and, and we just absolutely cut loose. So by the end of La Viva Wem, we all decided, all right, well, second act, we're definitely going to get into full costume. And so we got into full costume, and finished off the show. It was definitely one of the most most emotional nights that I could still, even to this day, that I can remember. Um, yeah, after you hear the final, no day but today. And, you know, I come out and I, and I sit and we have that nice little picture perfect clump. There's no applause. There's just silence. And then someone from the, the back of the audience says, thank you, Jonathan Larson, which is a phrase that we took and uh, there was a nice little wooden plaque that would get taken around to, to all the touring cast as well, reminding ourselves like, you know, thank you, Jonathan Larson, this is why we're all here. And since then, we all became a lot more protective over the project itself because in a sense, it was sort of unfinished because he was still working on it. Mm -hmm. He was still working on Act 2. So what was left and what couldn't be touched, we felt, well, okay, well, this, uh, we, we didn't know what he wanted. We didn't know how he felt about it. And so we were super, super protective over that piece, and it galvanized us. And it stopped being acting by that point. It became real every single time for us. Uh, and we felt that it was essential. It was so important that we got the message out, that we got this project out, that, that we allow people to feel the same way that we were feeling. We, and it became about sharing. Yeah, yeah. Were you worried as a group, and also you personally, that you wouldn't be able to replicate the experience at New York Theatre Workshop when it moved to, I, I think it was the Niederlander Theater on Broadway, because now it's more seats, it's a different venue, a different context. Were you still worried about opening on Broadway? Um, my 24-year-old brain at that time was more concerned about getting it right, just for mm -hmm. me, just getting my performance right every single time. Because by that point, in that transition between off-Broadway and, and Broadway, we have already did it quite a bit of times and they started to add shows, and every show was jam-packed. If anything, the weird thing was that the stage in New York Theatre Workshop was bigger, at least wider, than the theater at the Needlelander. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, the Needlelander was just taller, much taller space. Yes, there was a lot of, you know, this really isn't a testament to Michael Greif and his direction. He made sure that he made, remind 
and just the adjustments that had to be made for a bigger house. So for me, it was the worry was never any less than it was <laughs> off Broadway. And for me, I was, to this day, still like when you love something, you know, you take it really seriously. There's always that worry. It was like, I hope I'm completely. I hope I'm getting it right. I hope I'm getting it completely right. And and or I hope that I'm conveying what I need to convey. And so I previously, when I was a dancer before I became an actor, I. I performed in Brazil for a sort of a pop group uh, during the 80s. So I performed in front of large audiences before. So I was used to that, but I wasn't used to doing musical mm. theater. So the audiences never really scared me at all. What scared me was, if anything, what scared me was disappointing my castmates and, and Michael Greif and making sure that we just got it right. So by that point, it became like clockwork. It was just clockwork, just hitting it hard and making sure. It felt every single night that, for me, it felt like it was a dress rehearsal every single time, that it was an opportunity to make better adjustments, to improve on what we were doing, if anything, to make it more real. For me, it was just really making it all more real. And I remember always thinking as the character, that's the thing that always helped me is to be in it was to think as the character, to think as the angel, to go, all oh, my, my inner thoughts were as angel. Th there was no time to be afraid because there was so much already on the line. I think that was all of us. If anything, we, we were so, it was, it was shock. It was traumatic, all of, all of it. You know, the combination of death and along with the explosion of the show and the, and the media attention after that. I mean, especially for me, uh, I am a kid from Brooklyn, born and raised, never had that kind of attention before. I, I came from relative obscurity, and all of a sudden now everyone knows who I am. Everyone knows who, who I'm working with. Everyone knows what kind of project I'm, I'm working with. So I felt like I was part of this machine that I had to, had to be part of the cog. I was part of the wheel, and, and uh, I had to go, 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 go. So there was no room for fear. There was a task at hand, and we had to achieve it. And every night, that's what we did. Well, the interesting thing is I, I ask when I talk to actors who have been nominated for or won Tony Awards, I usually ask, how did that change that, your life or did it change your life or your career? With you, it almost sounds like the, the Tony would have been an afterthought. It was Rent that changed everything. And, oh, you happened to win a Tony. That didn't hurt, but you were already a name. You were already part of this iconic show. But I guess I will ask, did the Tony make a diff? Yeah, yeah, it did. It absolutely made, made a diff because, again, if anything, who knows? I, I, I just might have been that actor that you see everywhere doing a lot of off-Broadway shows or in the chorus of Broadway shows. I, I might have just been that if the show, show didn't open up also the diversity of casting as well. Mm -hmm. So it got my foot in the door. So you know, I went from being Wilson J. Heredia, who just does a couple of shows, to, oh, Wilson Jermaine Heredia. Oh, well, please come in the room, <laughs> you know, or, or absolutely we will see him. But you don't have a ton of IBDB credits either. Your only other credit, as far as I've seen on Broadway, was that you came into the revival of La Caja Foal, the one, it, it had starred, I think, Kelsey Grammer and Douglas Hodge, but they left, and the new cast came in, and you came in, I think, right. with Harvey Firestein. So, right. first of all, why don't you have more Broadway credits, do you think? Um... Because I think I'm a hard fit. I'm definitely a hard fit. And there just hasn't been a lot of projects that I that are perfect. I also honestly have to say that after initially winning the Tony, I, I was a bit spooked because it's a very typical thing. It's like you become your, your own worst enemy. I was trying to top myself constantly, and so there was always that anxiety. But I always preferred off-Broadway productions. But as much as now that I've fallen in love with musical theater, there isn't a lot of musical theater or a lot of shows that I would have wanted to be in. And I still was growing during that time, so I still wasn't prepared for the musical theater, as, as it were. I, I needed to be more, more shows right. like Rent, but there weren't any more shows like it. On the other side also, life just got in the way as well, where um, there were just other things that I was focusing on. Uh, I was trying to work on a music career uh, initially when 
because even uh, you, I, you have a few off Broadway credits, but and some IMDb yeah. stuff. But it's a it's a little sporadic and spotty. I think you you mentioned in another interview that at one point you kind of took a year off to find yourself, yes, as it were. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did because I was only part of that machine, part of the rent machine, and for me it was very important to reestablish my identity or just to find it again, to find who I was as a performer and and whether I wanted to do this or not. And, there's one side of it, there's the business side, and then there's the artistic side, and, and I was trying to create a happy medium between both of them. That's just a product of me growing, growing through the whole process. And if anything, I'm getting a lot more credits now than, than I was before because I'm just more mature. Uh, I'm just more prepared. And I can tell you that there was still, I'm not afraid to say, there was a sense of immaturity to me at that time. There was, uh, there was. Well, you were 25. Like, I mean, you know. Yeah, I was 20. Yeah, I was 24, and I just moved out of my parents' house prior to that, and then and then I moved back into my parents' house, and so when this happened, I was living with them. So there was that. There was living at home. So you know, after a night of signing hundred autographs and all that, I went back to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. You know, back in my, <laughs> my parents' house, and and then there was like, you know, did you shake out the garbage? There, there was, <laughs> there was all that. So, so was, well, that sort of kept you grounded, though. That's kind of a good thing in a way. Oh, absolutely. I always had a, a vision of what I wanted to do, and I'll tell you this, I'm not an actor that you'll see in Phantom of the Opera. You'll, you're not going to see me in Le Mis. Uh, wait, wait, no, come on, There's, there actor. isn't that much difference between Phantom and Camelot. I mean, they're both yes. old school, you, know, you shouldn't say that, because what makes you think you wouldn't be a good either Phantom or Raoul? Well, um... I, I could be, and definitely more now. Like I said, I, I have a lot more discipline than I than I had before when I was younger. The reason that I did Camelot was because in the San Francisco theater, well, actually in San Francisco in general, the casting is a lot more diverse. And I was surprised. Actually, uh-huh. I was I wasn't that excited, or I didn't think that it was a great idea for me to play Lancelot, just because I also was buying into the cultural stigmas and the limitations of what it is to be a person. And play other roles that are not. And thank you, Lynn Manuel, for actually taking it to the next level, you know, <laughs> I, I have to say. But the director insisted, he's like, I think that you're perfect for it. I think that, that your energy is perfect for it, and, and I have a new vision. So they have a lot more diverse ideas, and ultimately, their bottom line is never just to pack the houses, even though that's actually what keeps their theaters running. They're interested in experimenting and, and trying something new. Whereas Broadway, you know, um, right. it's a business. But but now that things are a lot more more open as far as casting, then yes, now you can actually see a Wilson Germain already in, in a Phantom now. I just didn't see it before. Back then, yeah. Also, I wasn't a, a typical musical theater actor where <laughs> like, you know, I would go to auditions and people would have their book and they have all these, you know, selection of songs. And I didn't do that because that's not what I trained myself to do. I trained myself to work on text, uh, be present, be on time, which I had an issue with when I was younger. <laughs> um, again, it was all of those things. And, and here's a but, question. Here's something that uh, uh, probably people are afraid to ask at this point. But uh, your, your big show, Rent, you played Angel, a, a transvestite person. Your only other show on Broadway... You played a very flighty, effeminate gay character in La Caja Foal. Do you think maybe on some level you were immediately typecast? Oh, that's what he does. He plays gay people who flick around the stage. Oh, that's a very good question. That, that would be another reason why I didn't have as many theater credits, because I was so convincing as Angel that casting directors or producers didn't see me as anything else, and they were so moved by the performance that that's all they wanted to see so there was a lot of me turning down a lot of stuff and i was a person of that kind of integrity where i said like where if i'm not going to be allowed to really expand on my talents and and really grow and and try different things then i'm not going to do it there was a lot of me saying no to a lot of things these are projects that i wouldn't say necessarily that i had them but just even the suggestion of, of the subject matter of drag queen and all that, I just wasn't interested in because I felt that I did it before. Playing Angel Well wasn't a result of me knowing how to play drag queen very well. It was a, it was a result of me learning how to play that character and, and developing with that character. So it isn't like I, I have these kind of characters in my back pocket. Everything, all characters that I, that I play still take work. Even, you know, mm-hmm. playing Poppy in Pedro Pan, 
did you do any research about Cuba for that? Yeah, you know, uh, well, there's the information that Rebecca, the writer, has given us, because this is based on her family story. So we always have that source of information constantly for that. Mm. With Angel, I was a club kid. If you remember like what that was and what that is in, in New York City, it's, uh, it was in, I uh, used to hang out in the Palladium when it was open before they turned it into NYU dorms. Uh, I used to hang out in the tunnel. I used to hang out in this place called the Underground. So those are the people that, that I was around all the time. So it wasn't strange to me to play that character. So that's what I meant when we first started this. Oh. I said that, that, that they were things that I was already prepared to do. And so when the opportunity came, I was able to do it because I was already prepared. Uh, I was already in that world. With Bafi in Pedro Pan, of course, I, I take a lot of my interpretation of, of Bafi. Uh, there's a lot of my dad in it. How my dad will also die for me and do anything for me and that the most important thing is his family, no matter what. So I have that. And along with uh, the stories that he's told me about how he came to this country and how difficult it was. So there isn't a lot of things that I need to read, but, but it always helps with certain specific things. But I'm, I'm a big history buff in, in general. So I do know a bit about the, the history of Cuba. And I was even there when I was in a workshop with Christopher Renshaw, who uh, directed We Will Rock You. And I was actually the first Freddie Mercury when it was workshop under the title Queen. Um, <laughs> and go figure, you weren't typecast. As, <laughs> and there you were playing Freddie Mercury in a band called Queen. <laughs> yep, I, that does I, carry I know, through. I know. Yeah, no, and, and the interesting thing, the, I don't know if it's ironic, but coincidentally, you are a straight guy, married, mm -hmm. with a, a kid. How did you meet your wife, and what does she do? Oh, my wife actually is a scientist, and so now she works in sales, selling um, gene testing equipment Ooh. to pharmaceutical. To no, you know, I wish, I wish I, I knew it because I bought a pair of jeans and they <laughs> fell apart. Two weeks I'm wearing them. It's amazing. So if she had tested my jeans properly, I could use that. If, she, if she's selling it, give me her number. I may, I may want to buy one of those things. I'll but, give you her card. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but here's the deal. Wife, kid, you're an actor and now you're doing more musical theater, which means you have to travel. Plus you, you do have IMDB movie and TV credits. How much time do you get to spend with the fam? And how much time do you have to be out there for a week or a month at a time away? Well, not as much as you would think, but definitely have to spend more and more time away from home. It's all about the priorities and, and, and what you put first. And ultimately, you have to remember why you're doing these things anyway to begin with. It's not just a selfish thing for me that I, I just want to be a star. I just want to be in the lights and all that. It's For me, it's, it's about sharing and doing what I love to do also fulfills me and what I feel is sort of equivalent to being a doctor where is that I heal people's souls. I know it sounds corny, but that's no, no, no. how I feel about it. You know, it took a long time for me to find a partner that was completely supportive of that, which is why, no offense out there to any, any other actors, but I just couldn't date actresses anymore <laughs> because it was just a conflict of interest uh, and relationships are hard to begin with. So it was fantastic to meet someone that completely was supportive but isn't necessarily in that line of work so it was a nice balance so for me it's it's i remember that the important thing is like why am i doing this i'm doing this actually to enrich our lives and uh, i'm working towards something before it was when i was just a single kid doing it you just do it you, you sometimes you don't even know why you're doing it you just you start something and you just go and and you go and go and go with my wife it truly gives me purpose and I'm looking forward to having children and, and fulfilling my purpose even further. We're talking with Wilson Germain Heredia. Just a couple more quick questions because one of the other things I like to do with actors and performers who've, who've been around a while is to say, oh, you worked with so-and-so. You uh, worked with this person, that person. Do you have any cool stories? So we kind of glanced over that you were in La Cage when Harvey Firestein was in there. Do you have any Harvey stories? I can just say the first time that I met Harvey during the first table read, he said, come over here, Bubala, come over here. And he's like, you okay? You okay? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> and I was just immediately taken in by how open and affectionate that he was. And so he was, he was fantastic. The whole time he was fantastic. Now, the difference.
difference between a show like Rent, where you were in it from the inception, to coming into La Caja Fall? Actually, you weren't just coming into a cast that was already there. Uh, the original people left, and you were there with Jeffrey Tambor and some other people playing Georges. But at the same right. time, you had to fit into a show that was already going, and, and maybe somebody else's costumes already, and the blocking was already done. Was that tough? Yeah, it was very tough. It's very tough also because the energy was different. It was a different kind of show, uh, and they weren't conveying the same message. They already had the ones, the actors that stayed behind, the performers that stayed behind, they already had their acquaintances, their cliques. There was already an energy that I had to try to fit in to, and by that point, it was over 10, 11, I would say like 11, 12 years since then. So by that point, musical theater with the, the new generation, they were a little bit different. So I found it very difficult to try to fit in, even on stage, it was it was difficult for me to try to fit in with the energy. My history prior to that was everything that I worked on was something that I worked with in its inception. Right. So for me, it was very hard to actually kind of go in and just try to fit in because I had other things with Jeffrey Tambor and his energy and, and working with Harvey. And it was just, I have to say that it was definitely one of the most challenging times in my career, but I'm glad that I've had the experience because I'm wiser for it now and I know exactly what to do in a situation like that and how to approach it. It's all really about adjusting and part of the growth of an actor in general. Again, I came into this very late, this, yeah. this kind of, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there are people there that have been doing musicals forever. Uh, I was still learning how to, to use those kind of musicals and like, oh, okay, this is the way we do it. Yeah. A, a musical that was closer to the Rent style, you worked with one of our, our premier directors, uh, Diane Paulus, on a, on a show called Eli's Coming, based on the music of uh, Lauren Nero. Do you have any memories of working with her? Got all my memories fresh as though they were yesterday with everything that I've worked on. Ah. Diana Paulus is very much, even from what I understand now, as, as she was then, she's very much a collaborator. She collaborates with her actors and it isn't like she just tells you i want you to stand here and say things and say this in this particular way or this is the way that you're supposed to be feeling she's very much about exploring so i appreciated that about her a lot and also she kind of reminded me a little bit of liz suedos mm. uh liz suedos is more about like we all creating the piece together um whereas with her it was especially my, my role was actually a lot smaller than the other girls that were singing. It was almost like being in a voice and movement class where she, she would say, like, how is it that you would feel during this? And, and uh, yes, you're supposed to be this kind of Mephistopheles character. And so why don't we just play around? And so for an off-Broadway production, you know, coming from something that's a lot more regimented, like Rent, where there's, at this particular time you're supposed to be here, you're supposed to be here. It was an adjustment for me to, to have someone say, like, you know, tell me what you want, you know, tell, uh, or tell me, uh, show me how you feel, and, and uh, let's try this. And there was certain, uh, some blocking that was certain set in stone and other things that were subject to emotional interpretation based on the night. And she was just, I have to say, one of the sweetest people that, that, that I've met in, in that position. And her and I met before, also when I was auditioning for some MTV project, so it was just nice that there was a familiar face. You also mentioned, it's funny you mentioned Mephistopheles, because I'm going to throw this one at you. One of your IMDb credits is that you played Satan in a movie called Bleeding Hearts, featuring, get this, Robert Loggia, Charles Durning, and Dustin Diamond from Saved by the Bell. Do you have any memories of working on that movie? Yeah, well, uh, Dustin Diamond wasn't there when I was shooting. Uh, oh. But, oh, it was, it was a blast. <laughs> Well, my Satan character was very... The reason that they wanted me for this was because they, they wanted a, a Satan that was sort of like in drag. Uh, drag. <laughs> there we go. You know? I'm sorry. Okay, I get it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was one of those. It was a lot more about just having... I mean, it, it was one day of shooting for me. Oh. It was one day of shooting, a very long day of shooting. Uh, but, uh, oh no, actually, no, it was two days. If you see the film, it was just havoc. It was fantastic, organized chaos. It was just a lot of fun. And any memories of Charles Durning? Yeah, man. 
Yeah, yeah. He just had the greatest stories, and it was always it's always great to be around those kind of personalities that that have been doing it forever, and you, know, you can just feel the weight of their history and their experience. I remember this one joke. See if I, if I can remember it. Uh, oh boy. He. <laughs> this is the one joke I do remember. Uh, he says like, you know, why is a horse better to date than a woman? Why is a horse better to date than a woman? Why? Because after you're done with the date, you get a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, that's one for the Me Too movement. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that that's the joke. I, I, it's funny. The moment you mentioned the thing, was like, ah, yes, the joke. I remember that. <laughs> it's, and, and it's his delivery too. You know, his delivery was like, because when you're done with the date, you get a ride home. You know, it was just, it's fantastic. Well. It has been fantastic talking to Wilson Germain Heredia. Now I've been talking to him, but you can go see him in the play Pedro Pan. It is running July 10th through the 14th at the Acorn Theater, which is on Theater Row. It's real simple to get to. It's it's between 8th and 9th Avenue on 42nd Street. There's a ton of restaurants there too, and you can see this story about a Cuban child and the poppy which he plays. Yeah, I've got one last question for you. It, you know, I pulled that Satan thing out of your IMDb credits, but if you could sure. pick a TV show or a movie that you were in, that, you know, not rent, something that's really lesser known, but that you're proud of, that you look back on, oh, I wish more people had seen that or could watch that on Netflix or, or rent it, what, what might that role be? Oh, yeah, I have it right on top of my head. It's this musical called Court Victory that I did at the Williamstown Theatre Festival. It was a lot of fun. It was basically Alice in Wonderland set in the quantum world where I played an electron, and because I was an electron, <laughs> always negative. And of course, there was the these other characters, which I was with. Sterling Brown was in that show with me. So was Charlie Day, and so was oh. Jimmy Simpson. It was it was just one of those shows that where after that they all just blew up and branched out. It was a lot of fun, and I really wished, I really wished that more people got to see that, and because it was a really good show. And the choreographer was Andy Blankenbuehler. Oh wow! As well, so, the guy who went to do Hamilton. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That was just one of those shows that I felt never really got off the ground. It just stayed at the Williamstown Theater Festival and wasn't seen again, as far as I know. But I definitely could. I could have seen that as one of those family-friendly shows that people would have left with, with just smiles, you know, it just smiles. But essentially, that's what the story was. It was Alice in Wonderland set in the quantum world. Afterwards, obviously, Dorothy gets back to regular size. And, <laughs> and, uh, Not Dorothy, Alice. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, Alice. You're mixing your, your uh, fantasies there. She, she follows the yellow brick road through the universe. It's kind of an interesting... No, I'm kidding. But... Yeah. <laughs> I am smiling like the most positive proton right now, talking to Wilson Germain Aredia. It just remains to me to say thank you. It's been a delight talking to you. I wish you much more musical theater of all different types and all the kind of work that you want to do. It has been a delight and shalom to you. Shalom to you too. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you so much, Wilson Germain Aredia, for being with us in the neighborhood here on the Dave's Gone By radio program of the stream live on this Saturday, June 23rd, 2018 with me, Dave Lefkowitz, and all the folks who have been tuning in and watching and messaging. We have more show for you. It's 11.30 in the morning, Mountain Time, here in Greeley, Colorado, coming to you from my beautiful and potato-filled office right here on campus at UNC. Hi. So, what else is there to do? on this episode. Well, we've still got a Saturday segue of songs in the news to play for you. We have Dave's Big Dick Cherry, where I'll be talking about the word bluefish. Ah, yeah, that's, that's the one my wife picked out, is bluefish. So that's coming up as well. And is there any other thing? Oh, oh and of course, we go back to our wonderful story, A Cow for Hangzhou. That's all coming up, but before then, we've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of culture to dispense with. And this is our weekly segment that we've been doing, been doing for a couple of weeks now called Limerick. 
Colorado limericks of the damned. So we all know that limericks are kind of, they're short, they're only five lines long, and they have a, a certain structure to them. And generally, the point of a limerick is that it's got a little humor to it, usually humor that is vile, disgusting, gross, and obscene. Uh, and, and that's why it appeals to me. So we've been taking cities and towns in Colorado and making limericks out of them, a different one every week. And we do have a new Colorado limerick of the damned for you on this Saturday, June 23rd. So let's get the theme music going, shall we? We shall. You're the poetry man. A limerick is a comic verse of five lines, in which lines one, two, and five will end with words that rhyme, and likewise verses three and four also end with words that rhyme. So this is a limerick. Rocky Mountain, Colorado, Oh, yes, it's poetry time, because that, that's the kind of music you play just before you were about to, to recite a poem. So, ladies and gentlemen, the city or town that we are honoring today with a limerick of the damned in Colorado is Avon. So, yes, you will hear Dave on Avon. And here is our Colorado limerick of the damned for this week. <clears throat> An unlucky farm girl from Avon was humming her favorite song, Rave On. She fell in a pit of animal shit, and that's what the town built her grave on. Yes, that's our Colorado Limerick of the Dam, ladies and gentlemen. I guess it needs some sort of uh, noise. Wow. Yeah, there we go. Colorado Limerick of the Damned, only on Dave's Gone By every weekend. Yes, there is a place, I believe it's on the, um, the WordPress website I have of my work, of my writings and my essays and my theater reviews and my plays, and you'll find a page there of the Limericks of the Damned, some of which we've already done on the air, but most of which are still pending. So if you want the surprise every week of a good Colorado Limerick of the Damned, that's the place to find it. Anyway, uh, we have more to do, as I said, on this episode of the show, including the return of Hansel und his cow. You said you promised me, you said you would. You gotta give in, so I'll be good. Tell me a story, then I'll go to bed. Yes, indeed, on the Dave's Gone By program. I think it's where the chapters aren't numbered in the book. We're more than halfway through. I do promise this. And uh, sometimes we do, it takes about two or three segments to do one chapter of the book. And that's what we're going to do today on Dave's Gone By. Tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story, remember what you said. You promised me, you said you would, you gotta give in, so I'll be good. Tell me a story, then I'll go to bed. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, telling stories here on the Dave's Gone By radio program of the stream. Our story is by Erna Holyer. Yes, we've mentioned this many times. Born in Bavaria, Erna survived Nazi Germany and bombings during World War II. Married an American soldier, moved to California in 1956, survived heart surgeries and breast cancer, because Erna, even though the book says Ernie, because they, they want to market this as a boy book, a book to kids, Ernie wrote a few different books, including an autobiography back in 2004, and she died in 2007. So, as I've mentioned every week when we do this, I had no idea this book existed, but found it amidst a bunch of other children's books and other items at an auto body shop. A per uh, <laughs> actually, a perfect... Uh, Connection to this week, considering the hail damage on my car. More, more of an auto repair shop than a body shop. But anyway, amidst the newspapers and 
car magazines and Dr. Seuss books was this, A Cow for Hansel, written actually in 1967, even though what intrigued me was the illustration for the cover and some of the illustrations in the book seem like they came from 150 years ago. The story itself is sort of pre-modern era. It's, it feels very pre-Nazi Germany, post-feudal, but before cars and everything like that. They, they never give an actual year for when a cow for Hansel takes place. But it's all about this poor boy and his poor but loving mom and dad who work on a farm. And that's fine, except a cattle plague has decimated the cows in their town of Oberhausen, Germany, and they can't afford a new one. So what can they do? Basically, they make the best hard scrap of life that they can. They buy a goat, which gives them some milk, and Hans goes to work and farm for another family, the Kaiser family, that's a few houses down the road. And he's made a deal with the gruff old man there, Mr. Kaiser, to say, look, I will work and plow this extra field that you've got nothing growing there and then there's wild boars that attack people in this field, but I'll work it. I will farm it if I can keep the, the stuff, whatever I can grow there. And he ends up growing potatoes. And now it's time to harvest. So he can take those potatoes, tons of them, and now bring them to market and afford to buy a cow. A cow for Hansel. So won't you join me in this week's installment for a chapter that's called Hans's Earnings. Okay? Are you ready? I know you are. <clears throat> Shade-giving maples, poplars, and birches Lying the road to Weilheim. Oh, so he, a little bit more of an explanation. Weilheim is where they're going to buy the cow. It's a, the big city of the time there. And Hans is going with Sepp, who is the son of the other farmer for whom Hans has been working all these months and hoeing his own potatoes. Right? Okay. So they're on the way to Weilheim, Hans and Sepp. Hans and Sepp enjoyed the scenery as they drove their wagons in tandem down the road past cows with tinkling bells. Um, <laughs> Don't really have the bell sound with me at the moment. Um, and alongside chattering brooks. Chattering, chatter, 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 chatter. Oh, did I tell you about my movie, The Producers? There's a chattering Mel Brooks there. The Amur River snaked alongside the road. Snaky, snaky, snaky. Mm. It's clear waters shimmering through the trees. Which way do we turn, Sepp? Hans asked at a fork in the road. Uh, and they also found a spoon and a knife, but apparently this is... A, uh, yeah, this is... Cow for Hans there. To his left, the road crossed the river on a solid bridge, and to the right, it climbed and crossed over a railroad track. We turn right, said Sepp. Have you been here before, Sepp? Asked Hans. Sepp nodded. Twice, with my father. Do you know where I can sell my potatoes in town? Asked Hans. Um, yes. Sepp is a man of few words. Yes. Sepp let the horses rest before driving them to the hill's crest. Hans appreciated Sepp's help. He noticed how he drove the horses uphill without overworking them, and he applied the wagon brakes on the descents. Sepp was all right. Oh, you go, Sepp. Let me get my thumb finally in the, the frame there. Sepp was all right. Ahead, the road leveled out, and the countryside flattened. Then they passed through a large village with an ancient monastery. Finally, Weilheim came into view. The big town sprawled amid its surrounding fields. Lazy smoke mm, curled upward from the chimneys. A church bell chimed the... The one day I don't have the bell. All right, let's try another. A church bell chimed. Four dings to the quarter, ten dongs for the full hour. Well, Hans and Sepp are growing boys. I guess they appreciate ten dongs as they're, dis they're experimenting. We made good time, Sepp. Hans sized up his two wagon loads with satisfaction. How many hundredweight do you think I have, Sepp? I'd say about eighty, 
Sepp stretched himself. My father sold ten hundred weight for forty-five marks last fall. Hans multiplied eighty by four and a half. This should give me three hundred and sixty marks, he announced. That is more money than I have ever seen in all my life. Don't get your hopes up too high, Sepp cautioned. Last year was a poor potato year. So, um, you may not get quite so much money this year. But suppose I get only four marks and ten pennies. That would still give me uh, 328 marks. Besides, Hans pulled his wallet from his inside jacket pocket. I have saved the money your father gave me every week. He showed a handful of silver coins to Sepp. A fellow could buy a lot of things with that much money, exclaimed Sepp. Hans chuckled. I'm going to get the best cow I can find on the market. That's the cow he's looking for. Okay. The wagons tumbled over railroad tracks and neared the Weilheim station. One track led from the station to a long, low building with the letters B-A-V-W-A, Bavwa, Bavarian Warehouse, painted on its side. Sepp drove up to the big loading ramp. A burly man, who looked as though he had fallen into a flour bin, rolled up his shirt sleeves. It's, it's cocaine. Gotta be. If you have something to sell, you have to go into the office first, he boomed. I'll stay with the horses, Sepp offered. Hans jumped down from the wagon, scanned the building, and spotted the door marked, marked office, and he knocked. A friendly voice said, Come in. May I help you? A lady clerk asked. I have potatoes to sell, ma'am. Yeah. Hans wished Sepp could have come with him. You will need a slip with the weight of your potatoes from the scales, man, before I can help you, the clerk informed him and disappeared behind the glass panel. Soon she returned with a piece of paper in her hand. Take this slip to the scales, man, who will tell you what to do. Thank you, ma'am. Hans went back to the wagons. Sepp pulled up to the scales and had the wagons weighed. The scale master scribbled some undecipherable figures on Hans's slip. I didn't realize Hans wore a slip. He's a little more questioning than I thought. How many hundred weight do I have? asked Hans, his muscles tense with suspense. I'd say about 7,500 weight. I can tell you exactly when you come back with the empty wagons and weigh them. The scale master pointed to huge bins where several farmers were unloading their potatoes. Hans was amazed to see full bins so early in the season. Could it be that things ripen earlier down here? he asked Sepp. Must be, Sepp shrugged. The climate is always warmer in lower altitudes. The boys unloaded Hans's potatoes. Well, you know, okay, potato, potato, potato. Okay, got it. With, um, where are we? With narrow, tined forks. The tines had round points to prevent injury to the potatoes, but even so, the boys worked with care. The midday sun beat down. Sweat dribbled like glistening diamonds from Sepp's forehead. Hans's shirt clung to his perspiring back. At last, the wagons were empty. Sepp and Hans tossed the heavy sideboards into the wagon's bed, then wiped the sweat from their faces. The scales master deducted the weight of the empty wagons from their loaded weights. The first wagon weighs 3,400 weight, the second one 37. That's up, that adds up to 7,100 weight, he announced. We thought we had 1,800 weight, and your own estimate was 75. Could there be a mistake? Hans was disappointed. No mistake, the scale master said. I had not figured in your heavy boards. Seventy-one hundred weight is all you have. This was nine full hundred weight less than he had hoped. It could make the difference between a good cow and a poor one, between an old cow and a young one. Don't take it so hard, encouraged Sepp. The scale master put grade 1A on your slip, and 1A's fetched top prices. Maybe it will make up for the weight miscalculation. 
Hans smiled again. He followed Sepp to the faucet and took a long drink. Um, 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 um. After he had washed the sweat and grime from his hands, he headed for the water bucket. The horses must be every bit as thirsty as he had been just a minute ago. I'll get the water bucket. Leave the watering to me and get your money, Sepp offered. Hans's chest swelled. Soon his hard summer work would pay off. He entered the office with confidence and strode up to the clerk. Stride, 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 stride. I would like to collect the money for my potatoes, ma'am. Where are we? Uh, Hans handed the woman the slip. Where is your father so you can get the slip signed? The lady clerk looked past him to the door, as if expecting an adult to enter. He isn't with me, ma'am, Hans smiled. Then who is selling the potatoes? The clerk looked puzzled. I am. Hans found it hard to keep a touch of pride out of his voice. You mean they are actually your potatoes? The clerk raised her eyebrows in disbelief. Yes, ma'am. Hans's confident air ha- must have convinced the clerk, for she handed him a pen. Hans signed the sales slip and carried it to the cashier. Seventy-one hundred weight at two marks, thirty each. The cashier mumbled to himself, that gives you a total of one hundred sixty-three marks and thirty pennies, he announced as he counted out the money. A hundred sixty-three marks. Hans exclaimed in dismay. There must be a mistake. My potatoes were grade 1A. I'm sorry, the cashier shrugged, but this year's potato price is low on account of the large harvest. Were it not for the good grade, you would be getting much less. Hans stuffed the bills in his wallet. He fought back tears, and his feet dragged as he trudged out of the office. Now he he was sure. He would never be able to buy that young cow. How much did you get, Hans? inquired Sepp, holding the water bucket to a horse's mouth. Hans blew his nose. And I think later on he blew Sepp. They have that kind of relationship. Um, He wasn't in a talking mood right then. Did you get four marks? Sepp wanted to know. Hans shook his head. Did you get three? No. Hans again shook his head. What? Not even that much? Oh, boy! My father will be disappointed when he hears this bad news. Sepp bit his lip mm, as he fastened the water bucket under the wagon. Hans heaved a sigh of resignation. (sighs) Let's go to the market anyway and see what they have for sale. So we're going to leave it there with Hans and Sepp as they're on their endless quest to buy a cow with poor Hans making so much less money for all his hard work, his determination, his shoveling, his picking, his raking, his dealing with a, a wild boar, and yet at the end of it, he just gets about uh, two and a half marks per hundred weight load of potatoes. So sad. If he only knew what I, what I pay for some of these guys, He's, you know, he, he'd be rich beyond his wildest dreams back then. But that was Story time for this week, A Cow for Hansel on Dave's Gone By by Erna Holier. Probably finish this book up by mid or end of July. We do have a a very cool picture coming up next week, so you don't want to miss our next installment of A Cow for Hansel. Here in the neighborhood, where it is 10 to noon Mountain Time and uh, 10 to 2 New York Time in the neighborhood. You're watching Dave's Gone By with me. Again, want to give a big thank you and a shout out to Wilson Germain Heredia, our guest in the neighborhood. Remember to go see him in the musical Pedro Pan that will be happening in mid-July for five performances only as part of the New York Musical Festival. And we thank, by the way, Scotty Rhodes for setting up that interview. Now, uh, Wilson Germain Aregna, just like Daphne Rubin Vega, another Rent alumnus, is now a friend of the neighborhood. 
He's a person who's been on this program, and so we like to let people know how our friends are doing, what they've been up to, because, you know, back when we interviewed Daphne Rubin Vega, she was, I don't know, uh, it wasn't, she wasn't in that play, the Pulitzer winner, uh, that was later than that, but, but, you know, she was in something, and then she's in something else, and something else. Same thing with Wilson Germain already. I mean, he's done some TV, and film stuff. Now he's in Pedro Pan. He'll be in something else a year or two or three from now. That's why we keep tabs. We like to call these folks the friends of the neighborhood. Our little bowl of Berlioz in the morning there for our segment, Friends of the Neighborhood. So here we go. These are the doings, the comings and goings of the folks who have come and gone on this program. For example, a uh, shout out to Ruben Santiago Hudson. This is your last weekend to catch his direction of Shakespeare's Othello at Shakespeare in the Park. That's free for everybody, if you can get tickets, at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. Um, the reviews were pretty good. It was kind of like it was a, ge a fairly gentle, nondescript Othello that hits all the right notes. So not rave reviews, but not booze either for Ruben Santiago's staging of Othello at, um, for the public theater's Shakespeare in the Park program. And then ending, not tomorrow, but on Monday, you've got, oh no, it's on Monday only, excuse me, this uh, concert version of the musical Promises, Promises at Merkin Concert Hall in Manhattan. And this is really cool. Margot Sappington, the, the choreographer, is co-hosting with our friend Jill O'Hara, who played the original Fran Kubelik in Promises, Promises when it was on Broadway. So you're going to want to check that out on Monday night. But also tomorrow at the Lori Beachman Theater over on West 42nd Street, you can see Richard Skipper celebrating New York with pride. So it'll be a, a cabaret thing and a gay thing with Richard Skipper, our friend of the neighborhood, tomorrow at the Beachman. And then running, starting this week on June 27th, there's... I guess you could call it almost a pre-Broadway engagement or tryout of the new musical Moulin Rouge, based on that popular film with Nicole Kidman. They're trying it out at Boston's Emerson Colonial Theater, and our friend Danny Burston is in it. It's running from June 27th through early August in Boston. Now, happening this Thursday at 6 o'clock at night, Michelle LaRue, she was in our neighborhood just a couple of months ago, back in February. She is doing one of her one-person shows. It's called My Summer Vacation, and it's storytelling at the Cornelia Street Cafe in Greenwich Village. Also, that same night, this coming Thursday, Loud and Wainwright III, great songwriter, he is at Long Island, the Long Island Museum in Stony Brook. New York. And then Friday, Loudon is still staying on Long Island. He'll be at the Stephen Talk House in Amagansett. The reason we mention all these Long Island things is, of course, Dave's Gone By started on Long Island Commercial Radio back in October of 2002. So you're going to want to see um, Loudon Wainwright at the Talk House in Amagansett on Friday night. Or you can see the same night, if you're on Staten Island instead of Long Island, Judy Collins appearing at the St. George Theater. And then on Saturday, Lloyd Cole is right here in Denver. He's at Swallow Hill Music in Denver, Colorado. He was our guest back in February of 2015. Very talented guy. I might go to that because I want to see Lloyd Cole. That's happening June 30th. Playing now just for another week on Broadway, The Iceman Cometh is that revival directed by George C. Wolfe and featuring, in a minor-ish role, our friend Dakin Matthews. He was with us back in 2012. Playing now also through July 1st, if you're in Milburn, New Jersey, go to the Paper Mill Playhouse to see... Donna McKechnie and Andre DeShields, two of our friends, they're in the Broadway-bound musical Halftime, again, that's at the Paper Mill Playhouse, running through mid-July. Our director friend, Bob Kelfin, is staging a dark comedy called The Property for New Light Theatre Company that is playing at the Harold Clerman Theatre 
on Theatre Row. Our friend on the West Coast, Will Mangus, he's got a play. And it sounds really interesting, too. It's called The Finest, excuse me, it's called Their Finest Hour. And it's all about the friendship, the strained occasionally friendship, between Edward R. Murrow and Winston Churchill. Kind of, kind of interesting, right act repertory is doing the show at the Brick House Theater in North Hollywood. Did you know that Murrow and Churchill were not just friends, but um, Murrow, who was married at the time, had an affair with Winston Churchill's daughter-in-law. So if you're curious about that, go see this play. It's called Their Finest Hour, playing in Los Angeles at the Brick House Theater in North Hollywood. Okay, moving back to Broadway, I want to remind you that A Bronx Tale is co-written by three different friends of the, of the neighborhood, Chaz Palminteri and also um, Glenn Slater and Alan Menken. And by the way, Chaz Palminteri is in the show now. He's playing a role, so he's in his own musical that is on Broadway at the Long Acre Theater. Also, on Broadway, School of Rock features lyrics by our friend Glenn Slater, that is at the Winter Garden Theater. La Chance is one of the Donna Semmers that we mentioned before in the musical Summer at the Lundfontaine Theater. Daniel Breaker is in Hamilton on Broadway at the Richard Rogers Theater. And off-Broadway, Desperate Measures, co-written by our friend David Friedman. He won a couple of awards for this just this year, including the Drama Desk Award for Off-Broadway Musical. Uh, that's playing at the York Theater, Desperate Measures. And moving to Cabaret, remember that... Jim Caruso's cast party happens every night at Birdland. And moving to the digital mm, milieu, motif, moving digitally, check out stagebuggy.com, Evan Seplow's website of New York nightlife, and, of course, subscribe to drdemento.com for brand new and archived Dr. Demento shows every single week. And a shout-out, of course, to Charlie Gross and Leslie Hoban Blake, the co-hosts of Two on the Isle on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as well as Eva Heinemann, who has her own theater review show, High Drama. Go to her Facebook page, High, with H-I, exclamation point, drama, on Facebook. And, of course, I oh, want to also give a shout-out to our Chicago friend, Mary Shen Barnage. She writes about Chicago theater for Windy City Times and also TotalTheater.com, so read her stuff there. As well as, of course, our friend Bob Cudmore doing podcasts of upstate history at BobCudmore.com. And those, my friends, are the friends of the neighborhood. Yay! <laughs> So, I need a little bit of a break from talking, just a little break, because uh, Facebook threatens me every time I uh, try and play too much of a song, even though this is a friggin' radio show. But, you know, every place, YouTube has its rules, Facebook has its rules, but we're still going to make the best of it and try and do a Saturday segue of songs in the news. And here's, here's the idea. You're, I'm going to play parts of songs, snatches, if you will, of songs, and your job is to listen to the song, hopefully enjoy as much of it as we can play, and think, hmm, why is Dave playing the song this week? What happened in the news? What happened in the world at large of current events, or is going to happen, that is reflected by the title of the song, the theme of the song, maybe who's singing it or doing it? That's your job, should you choose to accept it. So we're going to start right here with um our so oh my gosh i can really I, I totally forget that we have a segue an intro music for this i've totally forgot i did this let's play this extra extra hear all about it we provide the rhymes you provide the reasons it's our saturday segue of songs in the news Totally forgot I did that. But here's our first song in our Saturday segue. You probably recognize the song. I'm sure you recognize the singer. But remember, why is it relevant this week? No, I would not give you false hope On this strange and mournful day But the mother and child reunion Is only emotional 
Okay. So again, I'm, I'm apologizing for having to pop these things down, but immediately, you know, after about 30 seconds, Facebook will attack me. It'll stop my video feed. People have to reload. It's kind of a big pain in the tush. So anyway, I think you know enough of that early solo Paul Simon song to know that the song title is Mother and Child Reunion, going back to Simon's eponymous first solo album from 1972. Why would we play Mother and Child Reunion on Dave's Gone By? Well, that's, that's you know pretty clear. The White House and the Republicans took some flack this week. You know, they, they, they love to shoot themselves in the foot. They've got good economic news all over the place, and yet, they, instead of just resting on those laurels and allowing things to go to be okay, they have to make a big simus, a big crisis about immigration, and they took serious heat, even from people in their own party, uh, for separating parents and children at the border, border of uh, America, or United States of America and Mexico, and the Trump the Trump. Donald Trump told Republicans he'd sign their stupid immigration bill even if he didn't like it, which he didn't like it. But then Republicans shot down a fairly moderate bill that they thought could fix things and then help with immigration, but they couldn't get that going. And then they postponed the vote on a different bill that they came up with. Of course, Trump and the Republicans are trying to blame Democrats, but ha <laughs> ha. Sorry, you know, they've got the power. They're in the White House, they're in the House, they're in the Senate. And, it, you know, the, the hilarious thing about all of this is, um, oh, when well, you know, there's so much flooding through my mind about this immigration crisis, which wasn't a crisis until Donald Trump made it one uh, when he was running on his campaign. It was a problem. There are issues of drugs and, and some bad people coming over the border. And there are issues of being able to track the people who come here from other countries, for sure. But it wasn't a crisis. In fact, there were fewer and fewer people trying to get in every year. Because it wasn't that the borders were porous, but you came, you know, you were treated generally humanely. If you weren't caught, you could come in. If you were caught, maybe you were rounding up and giving information on how to get here legally. And then Trump comes in and says, no, no, there's rapists and murders coming in from Mexico. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing this. They're, they're, and, and we saw that um, press conference that Trump had a day ago where, yes, yes, he lines up, he finds people who's who've been traumatically affected in a negative way by illegal immigrants. So he does find a dad whose daughter was killed by a drunk driver who was an illegal alien. Um, um, someone else who was raped or killed by uh, an illegal alien gets a couple of these people as if this is a giant representative sampling of the thousands of aliens who've come across our borders over the past couple of years, as opposed to the thousands, the tens of thousands who go on to feed us, to clean our plates, to pick our fruits, to go to college, to go work in regular jobs, who save lives, who work as caregivers, who work as waiters. And wait I mean, you know, it's just like you, you take this one representative sampling, four, five people who've had tragic, not to take anything away from them, but they've had terrible, tragic experiences, and yet to make that sort of count alongside millions or tens of thousands of people who haven't done anything wrong except illegally entering the country. Okay, so there's that, right? And this is what Trump goes with and pins his hopes on this idea of Americans just want America for Americans, for the people who've been here a while, not 200 years necessarily, but at least 50, 60, 70 years with ideally for Trump and the Republicans, lighter shades of skin, right? So trying to keep the people out, except, I mean, it's kind of funny. I was telling this last week that our chair of a department here at UNC, I mean, what it took him to come here, he was hired by the university a year ago to come and chair a department here at UNC, uh, had all his papers in order, had you know, passport, trying to get a visa, etc., and his just his paperwork sat on a desk 
for months at a time. Well, this guy had sold his house, he's living with his parents, any minute he's ready to get on a plane and start doing the, doing the job for which he is being paid and doing the job for which he has been contracted by this body, this huge university here in Colorado. And what it took to get him here, finally, was not rational minds seeing the light of day was not clearing up some sort of terrible problem or issue with his visa, with his availability. No. It took him, out of his own pocket, paying $10,000 to a lawyer to grease the wheels and tell some functionary in the government, hey, take that visa application out of the stack where it has been sitting dormant for 10, 11, 12 months. Look at the fucking thing stamp it, and pass it forward. It took a lawyer and money, it always takes money, to grease the wheels and bribe to do that. And magically, within two weeks after the brief was filed by that lawyer, he's on a plane, and he's here. So there's no question that the rules and the ways and means for legal immigration to happen have to get changed. They're terrible. It is a disaster. It is a problem. But good God, man, um, you know, just so much involved on both sides of the issue in terms of I do understand wanting to track the people who are here. And I do understand worrying, you know, even though it's not fully true, this idea of, well, if we let immigrants come here, and work for less than minimum wage and do these jobs that Americans don't want and it's going to hurt the economy, it's going to hurt Americans. Meanwhile, they're doing this just at the moment that our economy is as robust as it has been since basically the Clinton era. In 18 years, we haven't had unemployment so low. So how can you argue that all these immigrants running around undocumented are stealing American jobs when supposedly there's more jobs out there than Americans who are able to take them. <laughs> you know, if our unemployment is down to 3.8 or 3.9, and there are more job listings than humans, obviously we could use some immigrants coming across the border to take some jobs, right? So there, there's lies and bullshit on both sides of this. But I am going to also take a little bit to the other side and the Democrats wringing their hands and crying and sobbing over the children, the children, you're separating the children from the parents, you're putting them in cages. First of all, you know, I think if, if a lot of children were brought up in cages, they'd be a lot better behaved, you know, no matter where they come from. But, you know, uh, I'm, people make fun of Trump and Melania and, and Paul Ryan and these folks for saying, well, you know, the, oh, separating that's not so bad, and we're putting them in tender care facilities and such. But, and, and the Democrats going, yo, you never separate parents from children. Never, 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 never. It's like, really? Really? I mean, if you are a divorcing couple, you're, which is, I think, half of the population, the married population of America, eventually gets divorced, you're separating the parents and the children, right? The children may get to visit every other week with one of the parents, but they're putting one parent's home and the parents separate. It's the whole fucking point of divorce. You're not going to stay married uh, and in the same living space unless there's economic necessity about that. And you don't want the parents staying together if they're fighting all the time because that's more of a negative impact on a kid than parents being together. So parent, children are always separated in half of the marriages in America. And you're talking about keeping children away from parents. Well, it's true that if a parent commits a crime that, and that parent has to go to jail for a year or five or ten, that separates a family. Talk to hundreds of people here in Weld County who have to go to jail for a certain period of time for something bad that they did or were suspected of doing and the jury convicted them or they pled out and they are in jail. Well, that means they're not home with their 2 or 5 or 10 or 15 year old kid. They are separated. And as much as, as we love our military and armed forces, what happens to a kid who graduates college um, well, or, or beyond that, or someone in, let's say, his or her early 20s, 
and they're in the military, where are they? They're, they're not going home every night unless they're in active reserve. Where are they? They're sent to the most dangerous places on earth, perhaps, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, uh, Turkey now, where, where, what have you. And they're away for four months, six months, nine months, a year before they get a furlough, where they can come home. And, and this is the big deal. This is what they always show on HLN or Fox News. Some little boy, he's in fourth grade, and his dad's away, he's in the military, uh, and it's around Christmas time, because it's always around fucking Christmas time. And the kid's at his desk or in an assembly, and ooh, surprise, surprise, there's Daddy coming home in his fatigues, sneaks up on the kid, look who's here, oh, Daddy's home, tears so moving, Daddy lived, uh, he probably has horrible PTSD, but he shows up, he hugs the kid, and then everybody's applauding, and the teachers are tearing up, well, how does that happen? That happens because in military families, the parents are split up from the children, right? You know, it goes on. It goes on all the time. Two working parents have to go make a living, and they bring the kid to the grandparents. So they bring the kid to daycare for six, eight, nine hours a day. Kids are separated. I realize that's not quite the same. But it's just, it is hypocritical. It is a little bit much to say that, oh, it's child abuse to pull these little children away from their parents for a certain period of time. I'm not saying it's the best idea. I'm not saying it's wonderful that you're putting kids into essentially the equivalent of Japanese internment camps. Um, but the kids are being fed. They're being clothed. They have books. They have toys. They have people looking after their safety to an extent. And it's not permanent. Right. And we're not at war with these countries. We're just saying, hey, you came here. We didn't ask you. You came here because you came from what Donald Trump would call a shithole country. And you wanted to be here, right? You come to our border unbidden, without paperwork, to say, let us in. We love America. You got the Statue of Liberty. You've got the sign on there. Give us your tired. You're hungry. You're, we're tired. We're hungry. We're poor. We have a crazy dictator leader. We've made it here. Please let us in. We mean no harm. But it's on our side to check. And it's on our side to make sure we have room for you and to wonder where you're going and to wonder do you have a support system here so that you're not wandering around the streets begging or turning to crime, etc. And that it's not being xenophobic to ask that. And it's not being anti any kind of race or religion to ask and say, hey, 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 hey. Yes, we want to take in everybody who wants to come here. That's the kind of country that we are. But sometimes it's easier than others. And if you're coming from a country that isn't in a direct crisis, like Jews coming out of Nazi Germany, let's say, or Iraq during terrible unrest, or Iran, then, then give us a little time to figure out who you are, where you're from, what you want, and where you're going to go. We won't necessarily send you back, but it doesn't mean that you come here at 11 o'clock in the morning and by 3 o'clock, off you go. Go, go pull a push cart down on Delancey Street. It doesn't work like that. So it is a more complex issue, I think, than the left gives it credit for, but it is also, of course, a more humane and humanitarian issue than Donald and his, uh, his wife <laughs> realized. I mean, and, and of course, Melania and the jacket. She goes, this, this is how the Republicans shoot themselves in the foot. She goes. She wants to see for herself, sort of almost breaking with the White House and what they're saying about the whole immigration thing, because she's saying, I want to go down there for myself. I'm going to see... Children. I love children. I care about children. I want to make sure that kids who may be separated for a decent reason are treated okay. That they're being well cared for while they're in American custody on her, our soil. It was a good thing of her to do. But of all the 500 days <laughs> that her husband just about has been in office, she has the coat that says, I don't care, do you? Don't care. Wait, if she had worn that jacket the day she came out of surgery 
for her, her kidney condition. People have been, that. wow, that's a tough bird. Yeah, good bird. I don't care. Do you? Well, yeah, we do care about you, Melania. You're the first lady. We'd like to see you heal up pretty well. But to wear an I don't care jacket, just pull, I mean, you know, she's the first lady. She doesn't just pull shit off a hanger in her closet. She's got hangers. You know, I, I feel bad, actually, for first ladies, because I can't just roll out of bed and go to the White House long and get the local papers and curlers and, and a robe. You know, everywhere they go, they've got people who look at them before they walk out the door and say, you've got to look like the first lady. So somebody approved Melania wearing that jacket to go see temporarily orphaned children on the borderline you know, people, for families who have less than nothing and are desperate <laughs> and that's what she decides to wear on the way it's the tone deafness is what may undo trump and his people more than anything else because if if the economy doesn't crash if gas prices do stabilize and, and we don't have people shutting their wallets, we may still have a good economy two and a half years from now. So if it doesn't crash, what will sink the administration among women, among immigrants, among gay people is the tone deafness of everyone involved in that administration. It's just nuts. Anyway, those are some of my fairly random thoughts about um, about mother and child reunion, <laughs> the, uh, the Paul Simon song that we started our Saturday segue here on Dave's Gone By live on this June 23rd, 2018. So this one's a little tougher. This one you've got to kind of think a little outside the box as to why we're playing this number. <laughs> Okay, there we go, from their album, Last Splash, which, can you believe that goes, how far, oh, got to be 25, 30 years old now, The Breeders, from the Last Splash album, and the song, Divine Hammer, remember that one from the MTV days, The Breeders, Divine Hammer, why would I play that particular song? You know, I could have played, I guess, um, Pete Seeger or Peter Paul and Mary singing, If I Had a Hammer, Nick Cave doing the hammer came down. Kind of a sad reason to play this number, but some sad news coming out of uh, Fox News, and not just sad because they're all nutty there. No, it's um, Fox News commentator Charles Krauthammer passed away after, I mean, <laughs> what didn't this man suffer with? But born in 1950, died on June 21st at the age of 68. Now, I've had issues and rages at almost everybody on Fox News over the years, but of all the people there, he's one of the folks that who was so measured and so calm, even in his conservative commentary, and kind of puckish and smart and witty. Now, he was someone I wouldn't turn off the, the TV in anger. He was someone I would just, I'd listen to, and sometimes I would agree with him, even at times I didn't disagree, it was kind of like, uh-huh, I will give this guy props. I know he's smart. I know he's looked it up and done the research and given it significant thought, even if he's a conservative on the other side of my aisle. And, yeah, he was a smart guy. He studied at Harvard. He was studying medicine. Uh, but then he had, famously, a diving board accident when he was at school that left him paralyzed, literally, from the neck down. That's why you only saw him seated, you know, talking like this on Fox News or on other TV. I didn't realize this. He was a psychiatrist for many years, specializing in mental disorders. Perfect for training <laughs> at Fox. Uh, for, for working there. Readers knew him from writing for the Washington Post and something called Inside Washington, which was a TV show he was on for several years. So all those years, Charlie Krauthammer had to deal with being in this chair and doing, you know, being married and, and having a real life and a writer and a TV personality, managing to do all this when all he could move essentially was like his, I mean, no, his neck down. So really, basically all his head was the only thing that could even move barely, you know, his mouth and his eyes and everything. 
Uh, and then in August 2017, he was diagnosed with a tumor that was successfully removed, but eventually it came back, and that's what uh, killed him. He died of cancer at the age of 68. He was a noted chess journalist. I knew there were other reasons to like Charles Krauthammer, and he founded, this is so amazingly cool, Rabbi Saul would love this. He was a co-founder of a society called Pro Musica Hebraica. Uh, Krauthammer was absolutely Jewish, and he, this organization promoted Jewish classical music being played in concert halls. Isn't that the, the coolest thing? So, yeah, if there's anybody, a news person that I would miss and that I feel a bit sorry about passing, it is Charles Krauthammer who passed away on June 21st at the age of 68. I don't know, he, he was human. You know, I wouldn't say he was necessarily divine, but at least for this eulogy, this obituary, he was one divine hammer. Well, we're into our Saturday segue of songs in the news. Coming up next, here's, an, here's another one where you got to play close attention to what the title of the song is. Unfortunately, it's a little more difficult because I don't think they actually say the name of the song in the song. But maybe you'll recognize it. The unmistakable sound there of Alison Goldfrapp from, it's actually a bonus track on their album Supernature from the band Goldfrapp. Kind of, if you don't know the song, it's kind of hard to get, but here's the hint. The song's name is Coco. Coco from Goldfrapp. And no, it's not spelled C-O-C-O-A or like cacao. It's spelled K-O, K-O. And who was KO'd this week? That's right, very sad to report if you haven't heard that Coco, the sign language knowing gorilla, passed away at the age of 46. He was born at the San Francisco Zoo back in 1974, and he was taught sign language by the woman who basically devoted the next bunch of decades to him, Dr. Penny Patterson. And according to her, eventually Coco learned between 1,000 and 2,000 words, either to sign them or at least to know when they were being signed to her. Um, and Coco was estimated to have an IQ that was 20 points, only 20 points below your average human, which is kind of amazing. Uh, she was twice on the cover of National Geographic magazine, one from a selfie that she took in 1985, took her own picture, and the second, and this is amazing, the pictures you see of her, I've forgotten about these, where she had a pet kitten that she just loved to death until the kitten did die, and there's a picture of her grieving on the cover of National Geographic. Um, they tried to mate Coco, to make little more, you know, coquettes, but it just didn't take. We tried with two other gorillas, didn't happen. And Penny, this is the interesting, this is the really weird symbiosis. It's, the story is almost as much about Penny's trainer, uh, I'm sorry, Coco's trainer, as it is about Coco. Because the trainer, Penny, never married, uh, didn't have kids, pretty much spent her life hours and hours on end just working with and bonding with Coco the gorilla. And this is something that happened out of a dissertation. Pa Dr. Patterson was just going to write a paper about um, this gorilla and bonded with it in such an almost weird way. I mean, so weird that it eventually became controversial. Former employees allege that Dr. Patterson would show Coco her nipples as a bonding ritual. Uh, I guess I better illustrate. No, just kidding. So, and she would ask people who worked with her to help in, in, you know, at the zoo that they, male and female, show their nipples to Coco as well. And some of the folks who were working with her and Coco were like, no, that's messed up. We're not going to do 
that. The case was settled out, of course, if you can imagine. So um, that's one story of Coco. Um, and we do, I like to believe that Coco was smarter than the average gorilla and did know maybe not a thousand sign language terms because people who um, other scientists looked at this all of this and saying eh, Coco really doesn't know that much language she's more mimicking what Penny is doing I'll, I'll give Coco the benefit of a doubt and say that she knew maybe 700 words basically enough to read <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I mean, if only Coco was still alive, we'd bring her on Dave's Gone By to read a cow for Hansel and see, see how well she does. But a big farewell to Coco the Gorilla. And uh, that'll cap our Saturday segue of Songs in the News here on Dave's Gone By, where it's just about 12.30 in the afternoon Mountain Time, 2.30 Eastern Time, which means it's basically, I think we've done everything that we have set out to do today. No, we haven't. Oh, gosh, I was going to end the show. I'm sorry, I totally forgot. I still have one more segment to do. It's Dave's Big Dick. Shigeri. Extra, extra, tell all about it. It's Dave's Big Dick. Shigeri. So, yeah, we've been doing this segment almost every week for the past couple of months and it, the idea is that we have a dictionary in the office here because I am an English teacher. Merriam-Webster dictionary 75,000 definitions. My wife early in the program just randomly thumbed through the di dictionary her finger landed on a word and then my job is towards the end of the show like now to try and talk a little bit about the word and try and think of something anecdotal, a story, use the word in that context and then, or in some context, and share it with you guys. This kind of puts me on the spot a little bit, just as live TV, live Facebook, live radio would do for a broadcaster. So that's what we did. And her finger landed this morning on the word bluefish. Bluefish. Which is a noun, of course. It's a marine sport and food fish that is bluish above and silvery below. By the light of the silvery blue fish. So, yeah, I've got to think. I, I wish she had just landed on fish. That'd give me a lot more options. And I was talking about cuttlefish earlier in the program, but blue fish, man, I was thinking this one out. Not much to say about it, but I do know that, um, let's see. As a theater critic, I am sorry that I never got to see or read a play called Last Summer at Bluefish Cove, which is um, apparently a, a nascent... You know, what the boys in the band is to gay men, apparently Last Summer at Bluefish Cove, in a lesser way, is for lesbian women. It was an early, I think early 1970s, lesbian play that was kind of openly about that. And it, it, it got some notoriety, even though it was playing in New York at a time when the New York Times wasn't really allowed to review gay or lesbian plays, or if it did, they had to give them poor reviews. But um, th this was one of the first that was really taken seriously as theater, as literature. I, I never saw it. But the first thing that popped into my mind was, okay, last summer at Bluefish Cove, I should read it at some point. And I know they've probably revived it here and there off off Broadway and just never got to see it. If anybody who's watching the program now who has commented or, or said hi and knows the play and knows if it's any good, if you can just let me know and let me know what it's about. So last summer in Bluefish Cove, just, just send me a message here. Now, another thing that made me or the word bluefish made me think of is when I was a kid and we were going, you see that moth going in the background there? I hope he doesn't uh, eat potatoes. I surely don't. I'm going to have to try and kill. That would be more fun than, than actually this program, watching me run around the room trying to swat a moth without knocking 20 potatoes off the wall. But anyway, bluefish. I do recall, and I don't think I'm recalling this incorrectly, that when we would go on vacation, mom, 
dad and I would go, uh, and, and sometimes we would fish. Dad was kind of into fishing. He wasn't a big sports fisherman or anything like that, but sometimes we'd get out a paddle boat or a canoe, or we'd go on a boat boat with our bait and the hooks and our little rods and stuff. And I remember we even had, we did have the Popeil Pocket Fisherman. And how many times did I try and cast that thing and I'd pull it back and the hook would get caught on my clothes. I and mean, you know me, I'm needle phobic. So you know, once in a while the hook would get caught on me and I'd scream and I'm like, I hate fishing, I don't want to do this. But then you just sort of learn to side cast with the pocket fisherman. I mean, I, you know, you remember this thing. It was this, uh, I love the pocket fisherman only because it was like a baby shit brown color. And I love the color brown. I always have and loved it even more as a kid. So I saw this thing and it was this, this brown color that I loved and it seemed like it was right for me. I was young, right for my hand, small thing. It wasn't this long with a rod and a fly cast and a bobbin and everything. So I learned to side cast with the pocket fisherman. Never had much luck. You know, when we would fish, I would get something every once in a blue moon, reel it in when it wasn't seaweed or when it wasn't the hook catching under a rock or a pebble or more seaweed and you pull and you tug and you break the line and you have to re-line the, the rod and put on a new hook and a new bobbin and it's like, oh, God. Every once in a while, the things that we would go for, that we would try and fish for were bluefish, but I never catch one of those. I think one time I caught a catfish, which was kind of neat, except invariably, even though we were kosher, right, and we could technically have eaten what we caught, mom was not going to sit home, <laughs> scale and clean a fish. Like, she didn't like fish that much in the first place. Dad didn't like fish very much in the first place. I thought fish were okay, so we went really more for the sport of it. So we caught a living fish, and it wasn't torn to pieces by the hook in its mouth. Basically, Dad would just take it and throw it back, right? N nearly all the time. Or, invariably, if I were fishing, we'd get something that was underweight, too small, underage. So um, one time I did get a catfish, but I think at that point we thought catfish were unkosher. They might not be kosher now because I think they eat, they're like shellfish and mollusks. They scavenge off the bottom. I love catfish. I think it's delicious, but we weren't going to cook it. So back it went in the river. And in trying to catch bluefish, when we go out on Cape Cod or wherever the heck it was, invariably what I would catch is a sunfish, which are really pretty, but you can't really eat them. They're flat and they're not apparently all that good tasting. And I think you can get um, caught on the prickles of them. You gotta be careful when you're pulling them off the, the line. You, you, it's funny, you, you see all kinds of fish in restaurants. You never see sunfish. And that's the only thing I ever would catch. I go in and say, oh, there's a little baby sunfish. Can eat it. Not impressive by any yardstick. And it's probably too small. It's too young. Whew. Back in the ocean it goes. Not a big fan of fishing. I remember uh, getting sunburned, being on boats because the sun is just pounding on you and on the water, which reflects back. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe in my older years, I get more the the zen of it, the wanting to stand quietly for an hour, hour and a half at a time, just be in your own head in a quiet spot, shady spot, cast out a line and wait, because <laughs> fishing is really about waiting very patiently. So this is why eight-year-olds, 12-year-olds, they don't like fishing. 10-year-old boys, the last thing a boy at that age wants to do is wait for something. You just want to, to do something. Go somewhere. Get in there, you know, throw a line in, wait 10 seconds, maybe something will bite. Joggle it up and you know, that's what kids do. If nothing happens in 10 seconds. Move the line, roll it in, don't roll too fast, you know, joggle, joggle, joggle. Tease the fish. Have it, oh, but you, no, you pulled it in too fast. You had a fish who was looking, who was interested, but you pulled too fast. It's like, oh man. When you're 10 years old, you don't give a shit about that, right? When you're older and you realize 
that fishing is about standing there, life going by, looking at the water, not being around wife and kids, not dealing or thinking about problems at work, not dealing with bills or a car that has hail damage, reaching perhaps for a beer, right? The Ten-year-old, you don't care about beer, uh, or a pop or something. And going to the cooler maybe for something nice to, to munch on. And then reeling in. And if you get a fish, fabulous, exciting. You don't get a fish, eh, new worm, back in, wait, wait. And it becomes about the waiting. And you can stand on the shore or sit in a boat or sit by the shore and look and watch. And you appreciate waiting when you're 40, 50, 60, 70, possibly 80, I guess. And I say this as someone who has not fished in 20-something years. I'm imagining this. I'm guessing this. There's a part of me that wants to go fishing again on an overcast day just to experience it again as a much more grown-up grown-up than the last time. And will I catch a sunfish again? whoop de doo Or don't see myself getting a trout or a flounder or a halibut. Probably more seaweed or somebody's castaway undershirt. But if there's a bluefish out there with my name on it, well... I can wait. And that is Dave's Big Dictionary for today, June 23rd, 2018, capping the Dave's Gone By radio program of the stream here on Facebook. I haven't even told you yet. Remember that if you want to hear old episodes of this program, there's a bunch of ways to do it. First of all, you can go to davesgoneby.com where the archives reside. As a matter of fact, we'll have the audio of this broadcast um, within a day or so available to listen. I'll be able to add more music than we're able to play here on Facebook. Uh, so, so the songs will be filled out a bit and they'll sound better. Plus, you know, you can uh, listen to parts of it again. You can uh, skip forward to parts or, or share with people because it's a podcast at davesgoneby.com in the archive section. And we've archived every show we've ever done from the very first one back in October of 2002, right through last week or the week before when we did our big Tony special and all the previous Tony specials we've done before that. So, yeah, there's a treasure trove of interviews and people and comedy and music and fun stuff that we've done on this program. Hours and hours of listening fun at davesgoneby.com. Now, remember, if you want to get in touch with me, you can send me an email, davesgoneby at aol.com, davesgoneby at aol.com, or you can just hit me up right here at Facebook, even when the show's over, or all week long. Make sure you like and follow Radio Dave Lefkowitz on Facebook, or tell your friends, invite them. Radio Dave Lefkowitz here in the neighborhood. And um, even more than liking and following, if you can put us as C first, that makes sure that every time we post something, or especially when we're on the air every Saturday morning, you're reminded, aha, Dave's on. Let's go see this. Let's go hear this. The neighborhood is in session. So do that at Radio Dave Lefkowitz. Or, again, hear the older shows, and sometimes see them, because we get the Facebook videos now, at Dave's Gone By. Dot com. Uh, what else? What else? want to remind you and thank people involved in this broadcast. First of all, thank you to my darling and adorable and wonderful wife, Joyce, who spent the first hour or so in the neighborhood with us today. Love you. Even though it's now a week past your birthday, I love you just as much or more than I did last week to celebrate your birthday and hope you're having a wonderful weekend, my dear. Uh, and big thank you to Scotty Rhodes again for setting up the interview with Wilson Germain Heredia, our guest in the neighborhood. So much fun, so great to talk to, so touching when he was talking about those. And, and he's told that story so many times, but I think he came up with some, some new stuff to talk about. Rent, when he was here. If you missed it, 
Remember, it'll be in the archives. Wilson Germain Aredia, thank you so much. And go see him July 10th through the 14th in the musical Pedro Pan as part of the New York Musical Festival on Theater Row on West 42nd Street. Pedro Pan. And thank you, of course, to Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. Now, Rabbi Saul has his own website, Shalom Damn it. Dot com. Shalom, D-A-M-M-I-T. Shalom, damn it, dot com. This is a great place to read and hear his rabbinical reflections. They're five to eight minute mini sermons. Also, ten episodes of his hilarious TV show that he did for uh, Long Island Cable Television about almost a decade ago. It's called Shalom, damn it. Rabbi Saul Solomon's um, Peace, Love, and Acid Reflux Hour except they're a half hour, and I think they're great. And also, not to be forgotten, his stage show, Shalom Damik, An Evening with Rabbi Saul Solomon, which you can see on YouTube, or there's a link right from the rabbi's website, shalomdamit.com. It's all there from the rabbi. And remember, the rabbi has a Twitter feed, at Rabbi Saul Solomon, at Rabbi S-O-L-S-O-L-O-M-O-N. And by the way, I've got a Twitter feed, too, Radio... What? Well, no. What? Radio Dave 2. <laughs> i got to remember these things. Radio Dave and the number 2 is my Twitter feed. So it just remains for me to also thank you all for tuning in and telling your friends and colleagues and co-workers and schoolmates about the Daverhood and that we're here every Saturday from 9 to noon or thereabouts, Mountain Time, here in my office in UNC in Greeley, Colorado. So, um... I should, heaven, you know, the good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, should be here next Saturday for a brand new episode of the show. Not sure who's going to be on it. Um, hopefully we'll have a cool guest. Even if we don't, we'll have more story time with Hansel, more dictionary, more limericks, more stuff as we do every week. You know, season in and season out. And this is so cool because um, when he was talking to Rabbi Saul, Wilson Germain Aredia mentioned that when he did his audition to get into Rant, first thing that he did, he, he sang Great Balls of Fire, uh, and he, he sang it in a certain way, trying to be theater-ish. And then the director, it was either Jonathan Larson, but I think it was, it was the director of the show, said, anyway, don't, let's try this. Try singing it, because you have a nice, high, lilting pop voice. Try singing it like Stevie Wonder. And wouldn't you know, he did, and, and it was a great imitation that he did for Rabbi Saul of Stevie Wonder. Well, Stevie Wonder actually came to sing with the cast of Rent uh, on their record album, on the that original cast album release back in 1996. And so there is a track on the album of Stevie Wonder singing with Anthony Rapp and um, Adina Menzel and Daphne Rubin Vega and our friend... Wilson Germain Heredia singing Seasons of Love. So, of course, this is the absolute song to play. And they, they sang it on the Tonys two weeks ago. Let's go out with, from the original cast of Rent, Seasons of Love and Gone By. <laughs> 